Yep, and you'll want to mute because otherwise the echo will be there. Meeting of the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners is now called to order. Would the clerk please call the roll? Presson? Here. Meta Castillo? Here. Dana? Here. McGuire? Here. Ortega? Here. Reinhardt? Here. Carter? Here. Thank you very much. I'll ask Commissioner Victoria Reinhardt to say the pledge for us while we all mute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Commissioner Reinhardt. Uh, we have the agenda and the minutes before us, but before we launch into our meeting, I'll ask for our moment of mindfulness and silence at the beginning. Last week, we did see the conclusion of the Derek Chauvin trial, which we hope signals that the moral arc of the universe is truly bending toward justice. Uh, while we know that we can all breathe a little easier given the verdict, we also recognize that there are still many signs of pandemic amongst us, health, economic, social, and justice. And we have seen many, many signs of those pandemics, including incidences of violence that have continued to occur around us. So at the start of our meeting now then, let's have our moment of mindfulness and silent centering before we proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would just remind you all to continue to take those small moments during the day as we proceed with our work. Uh, the agenda of the April 27th, 2021 meeting is before you for approval. Is there a motion? I so move, approval. Madam Chair. Second. Thank you very much, Commissioners McDonough and McGuire. Uh, is there any discussion on the agenda? If not, thank you to the clerk. Please call the roll. And so we have a motion and a second. Thank you. Reinhardt? Aye. Gretham? Aye. Meta Castillo? Aye. McDonough? Aye. McGuire? Aye. Ortega? Aye. Carter. Aye. Thank you very much. The agenda is approved and the minutes of April 20th are before you for a motion and second. No move, move, Madam Chair. Second. second. <laughs> Thank you to Commissioner Fretham and Commissioner McGuire for the motion and second. Any comments or questions on the agenda? I'm sorry, on the minutes. With the clerk call the roll. Reinhardt? <laughs> Aye. Bretham? Aye. Meta Castillo? Aye. McDonough? Aye. McGuire? Aye. Ortega? Aye. Carter? Aye. Thank you very much. The minutes are passed and we are moving on to the opportunity to hear a proclamation in honor of Fair Housing Month. I'm going to call on Commissioner Reinhardt for the proclamation, but first also 
to recognize that we have guests on with us this morning to receive the proclamation and for a few comments. Uh, we have Simon Opax, Govern Government Affairs Director and also Vice President Mark Mason from the St. Paul Area Association of Realtors. Thank you for being here with us and we'll hear from you following the reading of the proclamation. Commissioner Reinhardt. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is my distinct honor to be able to present this proclamation. Whereas the Fair Housing Act enacted on April 11th, 1968, enshrined into federal law the goal of eliminating racial segregation and ending housing discrimination in the United States. And whereas the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination in housing based on race, color, religion, sex, familial status, national origin, and disability and commits recipients of federal funding to affirmatively further fair housing in their communities. And whereas Ramsey County is committed to the mission and intent of Congress to provide fair and equal housing opportunities for all. And whereas our social fabric, the economy, health and environment are strengthened in diverse inclusive communities. And whereas more than 50 years after the passage of the Fair Housing Act, discrimination persists and many communities remain segregated. And I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna read that section again because it's something that we really need to pay attention to. We know it, but we need to do something about it. Whereas more than 50 years after the passage of the Fair Housing Act, discrimination persists and many communities remain segregated. And whereas acts of housing discrimination and barriers to equal housing opportunity are repugnant to a common sense of decency and fairness. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed, the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners declares April 2021 as Fair Housing Month in Ramsey County, and be it further proclaimed, as an inclusive community, Ramsey County is committed to fair housing and to promoting appropriate activities by private and public entities to provide and advocate for equal housing opportunities for all residents and prospective residents of Ramsey County. And it is signed by all commissioners and Ryan O'Connor, Ramsey County Manager. And as I said, it is my honor to present this proclamation. Thank you, Commissioner Reinhardt. And it is our honor to receive the proclamation and acknowledgement of the work that we all have to do together. Um, certainly a lot needs to be done this morning. I was looking at the mapping prejudice map uh, we had a special session on mapping prejudice recently, and it is astounding, and to use the word from the proclamation, repugnant to note the covenants that existed and the many other actions that have kept us from growing into the inclusive community that we want to be. We appreciate the work of the St. Paul Area Association of Realtors and your adoption of the mapping prejudice work and other work that you are doing to share in moving us forward toward that inclusive community. And I will call on Mr. Opatz and Mr. Mason to share with us following this proclamation. Thank you. Yes, thank you again, and good morning, everyone. Um, like was said earlier, my name is Simon Opatz, and I'm a Government Affairs Director at the St. Paul Area Association of Realtors, otherwise known as SPAR. Uh, we are a local realtor association representing over 7,500 members in 12 counties, including Ramsey County. Um, April is Fair Housing Month, so I'm here today to thank you all for adopting this Fair Housing Month proclamation and to discuss the importance of the Fair Housing Act. The Fair Housing Act, passed in 1968, prohibits discrimination concerning the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race, religion, sex, or national origin, and in 1988 was amended to include disability and family status. As a follow-up to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Fair Housing Act was the final great legislative achievement of the Civil Rights era. Before this legislation was passed in Minnesota and throughout the country, the real estate industry prevented all kinds of people from access to quality housing and wealth through home ownership. The Fair Housing Act was the first step to remedying this injustice. Since its passage in 1968, the Fair Housing Act has contributed to the country's continued integration and has, incre has increased protected classes access to quality housing and home ownership. Although there has been significant improvement in these areas, there are still issues of discrimination in housing. 
In 2018, the 50 year anniversary of the Fair Housing Act, there was an 8% uptick from the previous year in housing discrimination complaints nationally to over 31,000, which is the highest the National Fair Housing Alliance has recorded since it started publishing this data in 1995. And private fair housing groups are processing the vast majority of these complaints, about 75% of them, which is more than all government agencies combined. Of the over 31,000 complaints filed in 2018, 51% were regarding disability, 17% were regarding race, and 83% of all the complaints were regarding rental properties. There is still much progress to be made. The Fair Housing Act is a vital piece of legislation from the civil rights era, and it continues to protect many Americans from discrimination in housing. As a real, uh, <clears throat> as a, as a, Employee of the St. Paul Area Association of Realtors, I'm committed to the goals outlined in the Fair Housing Act, and so is SPAR, and I'm glad to see the, uh, that Ramsey County is committed to these goals as well. Uh, thank you all for your time, and I'll hand it over to Mark Mason. Thank you, Simon. Um, yeah, my, my name is Mark Mason. I am the uh, St. Paul Area Association of Realtors Vice President this year. I'm a realtor, I'm a property owner in Ramsey County and just wanted to say thank you guys for having us here today. Um, I would like to thank you all for supporting the Fair Housing Act with this proclamation. This is something that I, along with everybody I know at SPAR is very passionate about. Uh, the purpose of the Fair Housing Act is to prevent discrimination in housing and to reverse the segregation in housing. Although the law has done, uh, uh, done a long, uh, has come a long way since it came out, there still is much work to be done as, as we see today. Like Simon noted, in 2018, there were 31,000 complaints filed for housing discrimination. Uh, Brookings Institute analysis of Census Bureau data from 2015 to 2019 shows that despite the fact that people of color account for the vast majority of US population growth, white residents almost everywhere, including those in the nation's most diverse metropolitan areas, continue to reside in mostly white neighborhoods. At the same time, Black and Latino or Hispanic Americans in most metropolitan areas reside in neighborhoods that are disproportionately comprised of members of those same groups. This goes to show that we have not yet achieved our goals outlined uh, by the Fair Housing Act, which is why bringing attention to it is so crucial. I'd also like to mention um, that as a proud member of the St. Paul Area Association of Realtors, we have about 7,500 members. Uh, we have made a big effort to promote fair housing. Uh, Commissioner Carter, you had mentioned the um, uh, Mapping Prejudice Project. In addition to that, uh, we, were, we sponsored the Rondo Commemorative Plaza and we had grants for the acquisition and development of the Center for Diverse Expression in the Rondo community. As far as also putting on a variety of Fair Housing Month activities for our realtor members, um, including encouraging them to take the Fair Housing Pledge like you guys just did today. Um, as a property owner, as the SPAR Vice President, as a realtor, I am committed to upholding the ideals and goals set forth in the Fair Housing Act. I'm very glad to see you guys are committed to them as well in Ramsey County as a whole. Uh, we all know there's still a lot to do, but together through partnerships and a big omnipresence activity, I think we can make some really good progress. So thank you guys very much. We thank you very, very much. I see hands um, of clapping up in response to your presentation and also a couple commissioners who have comments. I'll call on Commissioner Fretham first and then Commissioner Matuskaskia. Thank you, Chair Carter, and thank you so much, Spar, for being here today. Um, your work in this area really makes you a critical partner for us at the county as we move forward. Um, thinking particularly about your recognition of what housing opportunity means and the need for us to build life cycle housing um, that provides opportunities for folks to, to gain the benefits and the generational wealth that home ownership provides. And I see that um, strong alignment there with that and our economic inclusion plan in that also your work on reducing regulatory barriers to, to building uh, new housing, to reduce housing costs and, and increase uh, choices and affordability. And that we need to make sure that there are options for people at all income levels to become 
owners of property and part of the community and your your strong commitment to this area is evident both in your outreach in the community and the trainings that you've offered and your position statement so we are so grateful uh, for you to be here today to accept this fair housing proclamation um, and to have you as partners in this work moving forward thank you thank you okay, thank you all uh, right, and then I'll call on Commissioner Mattis Castillo also. Thank you, Madam Chair, and well said, Commissioner Fretham. I The partnership is really critical, and so it's so great to have SPAR as part of it. And I also want to say congratulations to our whole board. You know, in this Fair Housing Month, we have released our economic inclusion plan. We've participated in the Mapping Prejudice um, uh, or ma mapping prejudice event uh, and really release the data to so that we can see our history so that we can correct it as we move forward. We've passed a resolution uh, to implement the HRA levy so that we have a continuing funding stream for housing moving forward. Uh, and we have prioritized as we talked last week in our um, workshop around the uh, American Rescue Plan dollars. Uh, that are coming to the county, we have said that housing is the most critical need uh, and put it as one of our priorities. So I really wanna say thank you to the entire board as well to prioritize this area of housing uh, in our community to make sure that we're closing the wealth gap between uh, whites and communities of color and that we are moving forward together. And so uh, this is one more uh, a feather, or one more niche in our, in our belt as we move forward and we continue to do this work together. So. Thank you all, and thank you for being here, Spar. Thank you so much, Commissioner Mattis Castillo. Once again, we very, very much appreciate your being here to represent the Spar members and the work that you are doing. Thank you for the reminders of your sponsorship of the Rondo Commemorative Plaza. I recall when we were there on that day, dedicating together that plaza. And yes, do recall your role in ensuring that that happened. Uh, for so many pieces of the work, we are linking arms together with you and others in our community, again, to ensure the inclusive community that we want to have. So we thank you for being here this morning. We thank you for all of your work. Thank you to the two commissioners who have shared. And I will turn to you for any final words as we end in celebration of this proclamation to Fair Housing Month and the work we are doing together. I'll just say thanks again, and we're looking forward to doing a lot more stuff as, as we move forward. So thank you guys all. Thank you so much for being here with us and here's to that lot more stuff. Have a great day. Thank you. Commissioners, we are moving on then and to our section for COVID information, I'll just call on our deputy county manager, Kathy Hadeen, uh, who is also our public health director and acting this morning for county manager O'Connor. Thank you, deputy county manager Hadeen. Good morning, Madam Chair and commissioners. Uh, as you know, this morning is a COVID information day, although because it is uh, Public Health Month, as we have named it, we are continuing to lift up and celebrate uh, staff who have uh, been going above and beyond uh, this past year with COVID. So I will uh, ask that Incident Commander Laura Anderson come up uh, to the podium and introduce our guests this morning. I'm happy to introduce an integral team to our COVID-19 response. That is our case investigation and contact tracing team. They have been working together since March of last year. Um, initially, I think it was a small team, something like, uh, let's say 10, 12 individuals. Uh, at its height, I think we had about 37 folks deployed to this team. Now we have a small group that stayed together um, to support our residents through isolation and quarantine. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Nora Moore for a few years now. Um, she uh, has been leading this effort in conjunction with others in our department. Uh, I will go ahead briefly and share how contact tracing does influence the rest of our response. The interviews that our staff lead um, with our residents 
go ahead and shape where we target our outreach efforts, additional health education, as well as citing vaccine clinics. So we've been very um, uh, appreciative of their efforts, and I'm just gonna go ahead and ask Nora, as well as her colleagues, Barb and Ra, to go ahead and join us at the podium and talk a little bit more about the work that they're doing. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Laura. Uh, my name is Nora Moore, and like Laura said, I've been leading our case investigation and contact tracing team, uh, or we call it CICT uh, for short. Um, it's sort of a mouthful. But um, so CICT work, it's the bread and butter of any infectious disease control uh, and prevention strategies. Um, and so in particular in, with COVID, the goal of CICT is to limit transmission of this virus. Um, we do this by interviewing cases uh, and then the subsequent contact tracing. Almost everything we know about the epidemiology of COVID-19 in Minnesota comes from these interviews that we do with positive cases. And these data are then analyzed, collected and analyzed, and given to our governor for decision making on determining next steps. So the work that our team does is essential in making sure that isolation and quarantine recommendations are appropriately given and that we also are able to identify any potential clusters. Um, in that regard, I wanted to give a little bit of information on the workplace uh, cluster follow-up that um, public health has been involved in, uh, specifically led by Caleb Johnson uh, in our environmental health division. So he and his, um, his staff, they follow up on any uh, identified cluster in Ramsey County, and a cluster is defined as three cases of COVID uh, within 14 days of each other in the same location. So we've had a total of 213 of these clusters identified in Ramsey County since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, ranging from three cases to um, there's one cluster with 39 cases. Uh, the average size was about 11 cases. Um, all types of businesses have been reported, so manufacturing facilities, food processing facilities, grocery retail stores, small, medium, large size businesses, uh, restaurants, fitness centers, anywhere where people gather. <laughs> Um, uh, with every report of a cluster, individualized outreach is done, so um, staff will call either the supervisor, the manager, HR department, um, or even CEO of some of these companies and have conversations around acknowledgement that transmission occurred in their facilities and then go through their COVID-19 strategy, their plans, what's missing, what needs to be improved, um, and addressing any non-compliance issues in regards to distancing and masking. Uh, the response from businesses for these uh, conversations that we've had has mostly been positive. Um, they've been grateful for the information we've been able to share. Um, and in the last three weeks, I just wanted to identify that our current rate does highlight that the risk is still there in the riskiest uh, locations um, for people that are not fully vaccinated. So we've received seven reports of clusters in the last three weeks. Three of them have been at restaurants, sit down indoor restaurants, um, two at gyms and then two uh, employee clusters have been reported. Um, so despite our best efforts to control behavior with the use of masking, distancing, and hand hygiene, um, we are still seeing uh, reports of clusters as things open back up. Um, and for those who are not fully vaccinated, these areas of um, spaces where people are uh, unmasked, uh, eating, uh, breathing heavily, um, still remain a significant risk. So I wanted to let Ra um, give a little bit of information about the case investigation side of the CICT work. Um, the work is complex and challenging, and these two uh, individuals are um, representative of our team that um, you have to be able to be empathetic at the same time as uh, a good detective and ask some really probing questions and understanding and finding that balance between when to push further um, and when to um, sort of back off and, and continue building that good rapport. Um, it's not easy. Sometimes the interviews are done through uh, interpretation, which doubles the time that uh, the interviews take um, and can also present opportunities for miscommunication. Uh, cases are not always in the perfect environment. They oftentimes are busy uh, taking care of loved ones or their family members or themselves. Sometimes they're in the hospital um, actively sick. Um, sometimes our staff are interviewing folks that have lost um, loved ones and are serving as a proxy for the interview. 
So the work um, requires a great attention to detail and empathy, and I commend Ra and Barb for doing this work for so long. They've been here with us since September of last year, and I'll let Ra now talk about her experience. Hello, this is Ra, uh, Ra Rand. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, and also thank you for the staff, CI uh, contact tracing case investigator. I started working back in spring, um, working with um, many individuals from uh, different backgrounds, talking to them. Um, some, some, uh, many are very happy. They were confused on the different steps, like what quarantine to take, knowing that you, they are having multiple phone calls from healthcare, from um, the friends, coworkers. So they're getting a lot of information out there and sometimes they're very confused and overwhelmed. So it's really good to be talking to them, going over them in like a very clear steps. And at the same time, not only um, we as a case investigator providing like steps, uh, what to do, we're also listening to their own stories. We are getting very allows, we're getting the options to hear what each family are going through. And I also speak um, another language. So it was really great to hear from another minority community, how they're going through, in, going through the tough times. And I would say a lot of time it's, I had a good experience. I, I, I was a good experience working with the, uh, the community. Um, in one instance, um, the woman were having a, one of the lady have, have, was having a tough time. She was uh, going through a big loss due to COVID. A lot of her family members are um, dealing with a tough time and she was crying and just was very happy that I was, I was listening to her. Although um, I may not be doing a lot of, uh, helping her a lot, doing a big, solving a big problem, but I was there listening to her problems. And I was, it's a really amazing, and many, many, especially many women, um, many families are having other issues too, but they're willing to take the time to go through the interview process with us. So I'm, I'm really glad to be part of this job. Thank you. Thank you for having us here today. Um, I've been doing the CICT work since September, beginning of September, and it is uh, very rewarding um, to be able to speak with these people who are really suffering. Some have lost family members and or their spouses are very ill or they have someone in the hospital. And it's nice to get their side of the story and then kind of uh, emphasize with them as to how to go about uh, making sure that they're safe and their families are safe and um, I do think that the vaccines will help. I'm hoping that um, more people do get vaccina vaccinated and I think to get out in more to the communities. Also the mistrust of the vaccines um, has been a little bit of an issue. Um, so again maybe reiterating how how these vaccines work. I also have talked with many people who have um, a very different view on vaccines as well as the COVID information because they're hearing it from all different places and a lot of it is um, not true. I don't say you know, this isn't true, but I do go over this is what the state has recommended type uh, uh, to talk about that and it's just been very rewarding. Most of the people are very genuinely, genuinely happy that we're here to help them and to walk them through the interview. Thank you. Thank you to all. Thank you all. Um, is There is an additional presentation. Madam Chair, um, we are all here, uh, Dr. Agawa, um, Lynn Anderson, and the team you just heard from, from uh, contact tracing and investigation to help answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. I wanted to make sure not to interrupt that presentation. I do have a question as uh, we are very appreciative of the update uh, from Commissioner McDonough at this time. Commissioner McDonough. Uh, thanks, Chair Carter. I had a question on the clusters. Um, 
you know, a lot of the clusters occur in, in a business where, you know, it really is going to affect just employees. It's not really open to the public. But I think I heard you say three of the most recent clusters occurred in restaurants with indoor seating. And I'm wondering how we manage, you know, that, you know, to give the public a sense that there has been a cluster there. I know early on you actually had to sign in at restaurants, so if something occurred, they could find out who was all in the restaurant and track you down, or you had to be, you know, reservations only. So again, they had a record of who was in the restaurant, but that seems to have gone by the wayside. So how do we manage where there are these clusters and, and you know, fitness centers, other places where the general public um, could be exposed to a cluster um, or um, risk exposure to a, a potential or a cluster that's just occurred in a public setting? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, so in our conversations, we do reiterate the importance of vaccination as one of the biggest tools that we have. So in terms of these three restaurants specifically, um, all of their staff have been offered vaccination at this point. So that was sort of um, one of the things that we were able to offer them. Um, we also still do continue to recommend um, using those, those, those strategies that you mentioned, um, having people sign in reservation only um, in order to enable the contact tracing to occur um, in an easier fashion when, when clusters and cases are reported at those spaces. So we do continue to um, encourage the same, the same messages that we've been um, giving throughout the whole pandemic. And um, we will continue to, uh, to investigate and, and follow up um, in these spaces and offer vaccination as our, our, our biggest, I guess, um, gift. <laughs> Thank you. Madam Chair, if I could take... just do a, oh, go ahead. A, a follow up, please. Thank you. Um, you know, again, kind of focusing in on general public safety because um, information is power in, that, in them making decisions about how, they, how much risk they want to take on. And I, I think the vaccination strategy certainly, you know, helps moving forward, but, you know, people may have been exposed in a restaurant or where there was a cluster. Do we, and I know there's a balance here but do we have a list of where the, these clusters are so the public can get a sense of, you know, do I wanna enter that building or do I wanna go to that fitness center if there was just a cluster there and take on that risk? I can start, uh, Laura can add anything, but yeah, so uh, the Minnesota Department of Health, the state uh, determines when to release sort of the names of these clusters publicly. And so in terms of restaurants, I think it has to have a minimum of seven cases um, in the cluster identified um, amongst both uh, customers and staff. Um, so there are, we sort of defer to the state to, to do that sort of public notification. Commissioner McDonough, one more activity that we've been involved with is uh, just getting the word out communications wise to these restaurants. Uh, now that vaccine is so readily available, we have opportunities not just to offer vaccine to employees, but to diners. So, you know, our, our environmental health staff are working with communications to support um, outreach to residents, you know, a QR code so you can scan and make your appointment while you're out uh, in the neighborhood. So we have a lot of opportunities here to get the word out and slow down transmission. And, and obviously, uh, we will continue to rely on the state for notification of those larger clusters in local uh, businesses. Thank you. Commissioner Ortega? Then we have one following question and we'll be working toward wrapping up our updating. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is really about vaccinations. And my question is, what data do we have regarding the number of folks that have not taken their second shot, their second vaccination in Minnesota? Yep. Absolutely, uh, Commissioner Ortega. So we know that we have seen a delay in uptake with our second dose. I believe it was sitting around 8% of all doses um, here locally. That second dose was either delayed or um, deferred 
Um, so for those individuals, we have been calling them, emailing them, wrapping our arms around them to attempt to get them into multiple uh, vaccine appointments. That's where it stands right now. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And finally, Commissioner McGuire. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for all of your work. It's, it's amazing. I Just a, a, a question about contract tracing, because I actually didn't know we were still doing it because it felt like it was such a massive undertaking. So as, as, as you've been saying, you know, you need empathy and you need, um, you need good detective work. Um, with everybody getting the vaccine with us, encouraging everybody, um, just, could you just comment a, a, a little bit on, on the degree that we're still, we're still doing this? I mean, obviously we're, we're still doing it because you're in front of us today telling us about it. But I, I'm just curious about the extent that we, do, that we do that because we just want everybody to get vaccinated and we want everybody to be, um, you know, tested and stuff. So could you just comment a little bit on that, on that yeah. effort? Um, great question. Yeah, so we've been doing this uh, continuously from the beginning. Um, like I said, it's sort of, uh, it's the only way we know where uh, COVID is in our communities is by doing these interviews. And so it's an integral part of this response. Um, we find that in, at the peak uh, in November, we had 671 cases reported on November 9th. That was the highest number of cases each day. Um, right now, we're going between 100 and 200 cases a day. That's uh, higher than it ever was in May or all throughout last summer. Um, so it's similar levels to what we were seeing end of December, early January. So we are still having COVID-19 uh, cases reported at a, at a significantly increased um, uh, rate than, than we have at other times during this pandemic. So our work does continue. Um, so every, every case, uh, the goal is to call every case within 24 hours of their wow. lab result being reported. And so at these higher numbers, um, our capacity definitely is strained. Um, so okay. we've entered a partnership with the State Health Department. Um, we're calling it the Regional CICT Hub. So we're able to sort of uh, be supported by MDH in terms of uh, the staffing of this work. So um, we, we continue on, <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's not going away. I, I appreciate thank you I appreciate that that uh, added information it was just I was um, just thinking about yeah how how we're able to do that but just thank you so much for all of that work and it and it does continue on so thank you and thank you Commissioner McGuire while hands are still raised I'm assuming that they will be going down from comments that have been made and I'll call back on um our deputy county manager first with thanks for all who are here today to share the information and the stories about the important work that is being done in this contact investigation and tracing arena. We're so appreciative for your work and commitment to serve our community in this way during this important time. Uh, and I'll ask for deputy county manager Hadeen to share any final thoughts as we move on in our agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really appreciate the opportunity to highlight this important work. This being able to still do contact tracing investigation allows us to, to contact people and to talk to people and to help still have that touch with people to help um, people understand how important it is to take this seriously, to uh, take care of themselves, to get the essential services that they still need. We're still providing those as a public health department and to then now say there is access to a vaccine and we can help you get that. So this work is extremely important and so glad to be able to highlight today. The last thing uh, we wanna lift up is Wednesday, April 28th. It's uh, the monthly COVID conversation with Dr. Lynn Ogawa. Uh, and so people still continue to have you know, hesitation and wanna learn more about vaccines, this is the place to go. So if you go to www.ramseycounty.us slash vaccine conversations, you can be a part of that next vaccine conversation with Dr. Lynn Ogawa. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for being here with us this morning and all the roles you're performing. We appreciate it. We are going to move on then to our administrative items. I'll call on Commissioner Reinhardt to take us through. Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. The first item is the repurchase 
uh, I will move the following. Uh, number five is repurchase of a tax forfeited property located at 53 Cook Avenue West in St. Paul, Minnesota. Number six, repurchase of a tax forfeited property located at 78 10th Street East Unit P291 in St. Paul. Number seven, repurchase of a tax forfeited property located at 353 Larch Street in St. Paul. Number eight, cancellation of 2020 forfeiture of 903 Burr Street, St. Paul, Minnesota. Number And number nine, COVID-19 disaster recovery National Dislocated Worker Grant Award from the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. Madam Chair, I'll second. Second. Thank you very much. There is the motion and the second. Is there any discussion on the items? None have been pulled. Lacking discussion, I will call on the clerk to call the roll. Reinhardt. Aye. Aye. Pretham? Aye. Mata Castillo? Aye. McDonough? Aye. McGuire? Aye. Ortega? Aye. Carter? Aye. Thank you very much. The entire administrative agenda has passed. And we are on to our policy item. There is feedback that I am hearing if anyone can adjust. I hope it's not me. <laughs> I'd appreciate it. Okay, so we are on to our policy item and we have before us the Metropolitan Council to share a presentation with us regarding the 2021 annual operating grant agreement with Metropolitan Council. I'll ask for a motion to get the item uh, which does have approval of the 2021 annual operating grant agreement as an action. Is there a motion? I'll move approval. Second. Okay. Thank you. There is a motion and a second. And we are thankful to have the Met Council here to present with us. I uh, do see that Wes Poistra is on the screen. And I've also seen Edwin Petrie. And I, yes, so I do see both on the screen. And we'll turn it over to you for your presentation. We appreciate that you're here to share the information about the grant agreement with us and that we also have the opportunity to have discussion with you. Uh, we'll turn to the presentation uh, and share with us if you'd like us to hold questions or if questions are welcome during your presentation. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, thank you for having us today. And, and uh, for the record, my name is Wes Koistrid. I serve as the general manager for Metro Transit. I think as far as questions, if we can get through the presentation that would that you, you might have some of your questions answered by virtue of the presentation but of course if there's something pressing that is we'll, we'll certainly take any questions at your at your desire so um, I'm going to begin the with introductory remarks focusing on our 2020 service experience and then Ed Petrie uh, Metro Transit's director of finance will provide detail on our 2021 operating grant request for the green line uh, like for so many, 2020 was an extremely challenging and difficult year for Metro Transit. For most of the first part of 2020, we were experiencing ridership that was stronger than the previous year. But once the existent, existence of the pandemic was communicated, ridership dropped immediately. For most of the three quarters of 2020, we experienced ridership losses of approximately 65% for bus, 75% for light rail, and 95% for commuter rail. It's worth noting the bus ridership performed differently by types of bus service with arterial bus rapid transit lines like A-Line and C-Line losing the least ridership and with local routes also performing uh, better than average. As you might expect, uh, commuter bus, express bus service performed most poorly and similarly to North Star with ridership losses in the 90 to 95% range. Metro Transit's response to the pandemic has been and continues to be based on public health guidance. Our approaches to social distancing and mask requirements for employees and riders, contact tracing, disinfecting rail cars and buses, uh, 
ventilation of rolling stock adjustments, quarantining, and, and other interventions have consistently followed the recommendations and requirements of the Minnesota Department of Health and the CDC. Soon after the start of the pandemic, we asked our riders to limit their use of transit to essential rides only. As you can imagine, uh, this was a difficult message for an organization of transit advocates to deliver. We also reduced our rail and bus capacity to 25% of normal seating capacity and added trips and larger buses to high demand routes, primarily local routes to best support social distancing standards. Based upon consultation with the Minnesota Department of Health, we recently changed our rolling stock capacity limits from 25% to 50% of seated capacity. We have also changed our essential ride only message to travel responsibly. Since the beginning of the pandemic, more than 400 on-site essential Metro Transit employees have tested positive for COVID. So contact tracing, as was discussed earlier uh, in the meeting, has been a prevalent activity in our operations. Thankfully, we have received significant federal relief funding through CARES, CRISA, and most recently, the American Rescue Plan. Consistent with the purpose of the federal funding allocation, these funds are prioritized to continue transit operations. But even prior to the pandemic, we faced a significant operating structural deficit across all council transit services. And the significant losses in fare revenues and the cost of COVID-related cleaning as a result of the pandemic and service protocols have added to those structural deficits. We are using federal funding to assist in balancing uh, the operating budgets of all regional transit services through state fiscal year 2025 and to indirectly address deferred capital maintenance, particularly in the light rail system. Regional transit services receiving a share of the federal funding include commuter rail, light rail, bus, metro mobility, contacted bus services, and suburban opt-out transit providers. I will mention that, that the federal funding doesn't come to us in one lump sum. We have to earn it through, through expenses that we have to report to the FTA that are eligible expenses to draw down those funds. Light Rail is expected to receive approximately $100 million in direct operating benefit and $75 million in indirect capital maintenance benefit, or about over or about 35% of the funds that Metro Transit is receiving of, of, of across all those others, other recipients of, of the funding. Ed Petrie will be providing more detail on this when he presents the grant request. But with a structural deficit and using one-time funding to balance our budget, the Metro Transit, the Metropolitan Council rather, will face an annual biennial structural deficit of about 130 million per year across all regional transit services. Finally, I want to update you on rail service schedules. Commuter rail service has been reduced from 72 trips per week to 20 trips per week. Weekday light rail schedules are now the same as weekday service, as weekend service, rather. Uh, this accounts for weekday travel patterns that no longer reflect nine to five commuter peaks at the beginning and, and, each, uh, and end of each day. Today, the week, weekday travel patterns, like weekends, have a single, single ridership peak that occurs in mid to late afternoon. These travel patterns, of course, can change as, as, we, as hopefully we, we put the pandemic behind us. Like all transit providers, we remain uncertain about the long-term transit ridership patterns that will emerge over time once the, once the, tran the pandemic uh, is over. So with that, and with your approval, Chair Carter, I would like to hand it off to Ed Petrie to cover our 2021 operating request. Thank you very much, Mr. Koistra, and of course, welcome, Ed. Good morning, Chair, Committee members, Ed Petrie, uh, Director of Finance with Metro Transit. First of all, Chair, I'll ask, can you hear me? Good deal. Thank you very much. Uh, I will go through the presentation, and I assume as I go slide by slide, I'll ask the, uh, the slide person to advance my slides. So let's move on to the next slide. Okay, I'm gonna to touch a few more items on the COVID service impacts uh, upon what Wes had talked about. Then I'll go into some more detail on the federal relief funding, uh, a little more detail on ridership, then we'll move into the 2021 grant request. So first of all, just some more highlights on the COVID service impacts. As Wes had mentioned, this was a major change with our operations in 2020 and moving forward into 2021. Uh, we did additional cleaning and 
extensive cleaning of both our vehicles, trains, our customer facilities, support facilities and garages, requiring customers to wear masks uh, and re require our employees to wear masks. Uh, we've, like Wes talked about the social distancing. Uh, one of the important things though is from a financial standpoint that we've done is we've done a lot of a real extensive tracking of all of our COVID expenses. We're tracking it, we're tracking it on the general ledger per a per specific general ledger code. The reason we're doing this is to make sure that these expenses are eligible and then would be eligible for the federal funds. Because there, there is a requirement with the federal funding that it is federally eligible, compliant with federal requirements. So we are tracking that to ensure federal compliance. Uh, so let's, let's move to the next slide. So as Wes had mentioned, one of the pleasing surprises that we had in 2020 and moving now into 2021 are the various uh, packages of federal relief funding that we did receive as an agency. Uh, very, very pleased to have received these funds. Uh, some of the overall arching uh, components of this, these funds is that they require 100% federal funds with no local match. And why that's important is generally in the past, we received like, for example, 5307 formula funding based upon our, based upon our service. We use that funding then to buy our shelters, buy our buses, repair our trains, those types of items. Those types of items always required, it's an 80-20 split, 80% 80 federal with a 20% local match that the council generally uses our regional transit capital bonding authority that we get from the legislature to match those federal funds. One of the components with the federal funding though, both uh, all three of the relief packages are, they are 100% federal with no local match required. So that is one thing that's good. Uh, the next thing is it has pre-awarded eligibility going back to all three packages go back to January 20th of 2020 uh, for expense eligibility. And one of the other things that, that Wes did uh, uh, point to is the fact is that this these funds are not a block grant that we apply for the money and get get all the money in at one time. These funds are based on, are only available when we can pull them, pull the, the monies based upon eligible expenses. So as we incur costs, it's on a reimbursement basis. We incur the costs. We can then substantiate to the FTA that we do have the eligible expenses. They will then reimburse us. So let's just go through the three different uh, areas of federal funding that we receive. First of all, the first one is CARES. It's a coronavirus aid. I am sorry, but we are not hearing you, Mr. Petrie. Hello, Mr. Petrie. We are not hearing you. Not hearing, not hearing, not hearing. Madam Can you Chair, hear us? Are you able to hear the chambers? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think that we got the message across that something is wrong. Um, Mr. Koistra, are you there? Yeah, Madam Chair, I am, I am here. Okay. Uh, I apologize for the technical difficulties. I see, I see Ed trying to get them corrected. Mm -hmm. Likely he will need to sign out and come back in. Uh, we appreciate the information that is coming before us when he is able to get back in. I know that he will continue to present um, the set of resources and how they are being allocated across the needs at Met Council to ensure that we have the transit ways that we need and um, are able to enhance and improve those transit ways as we build them out. I see he's left his chair um, and I'm going to assume it's going to take him a little time before he is able to rejoin us. In the meantime, let me just say thank you for not only being here to share with us but also for understanding that as we hear the information you've presented, and quite frankly, as we've been attentive to uh, the developments in particular uh, during this past period of time, as we've watched and have been concerned that we are going to be able to continue yeah, uh, your, to build your... the systems that we need. Uh, Mr. Koistra? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I maybe I'll just pull back for a little while and see if we have. Madam, Madam Chair, uh, 
Mr. P, I'm going to have Mr. Petrie use use my computer so that we can Great. continue the the presentation. My apologies again. No problem. And then we will be able to hear his presentation and be able to share questions and discussion with you following our work in partnership together to ensure the transit ways we need. Thank you very much, Mr. Petrie. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Sorry, <laughs> I may be a little breath out of breath. I ran down two flights of stairs, so <laughs> I am with you now. So uh, thank you very much. I'll move to the presentation. Okay, so on the federal relief funding, as I was saying, the first level of funding uh, was the CARES funds. Uh, the CARES funds, once again, it was signed into law on March 27th of 20, uh, 2020. Nationally, there was $25 billion for transit infrastructure grants. Uh, the council did receive about $226 million of that. And this, these funds were based upon an all, these are funds are, were based upon the federal 5307 formula allocation across the nation. So how the formula funds were distributed through cross nation in 2018, they came to every transit agency in the United States based upon that distribution. Uh, of that $214 million went to the council and about $12.1 million went to our regional providers like Southwest, Apple Valley, MBTA, Plymouth, Maple Grove. Uh, the focus of the funding, funding once again was for lost revenues, COVID cleaning and a focus with salaries and benefits. And the council did its initial allocation based on lost revenues with the goal to balance transfer operations through 2020 and 2021. Uh, then we received our second level of funding, which was called CRISA, uh, which is the Coronavirus Response Relief and Supplemental Act of 2021. This was signed into law in December of 2020. This had a little different piece on it that basically it went to, it looked at you could not exceed 75% of your 2020-18 NTD expenses. NTD is the National Transit Database. Metro Transit, all of our family services, including every transit agency across the United States, files an NTD cost report every year, which reports all of our expenses, revenues, et cetera. So the, the CRISA grant could not exceed 75% of those expenses. Uh, we did apply for this grant. The first grant, First World Cares, we applied for in May of last year and did receive that sometime later in June. Uh, the CRISA funds, uh, we have applied for the grant in late March of 2021, and we anticipate within the next week to two weeks, we should have that grant in place with the federal government and be able to begin starting to pull on those funds. That was a $13.2 billion national infrastructure grant. Uh, the council did receive about $185.9 million from that. Uh, that was then split $176 million to the council and $9.9 .9 million to the regional, uh, regional providers. With this, we were able to then to stretch our uh, council transit operations through state fiscal years 22 and 23. Uh, so that did give us a little bit of, of relief. Then uh, the third round of federal funding came into, uh, came into place. Uh, this was called ARP or American Rescue Plan uh, funds. This was signed into law in, in March 11th of 2021. Uh, nationally, there was about $26.5 billion nationally for infrastructure grants, of which the council received just over $313 million. Uh, this was based again on the 2018 NTD expenses of which you could not exceed 132% of your expenses. So the council did receive 313 of which 296 million would stay with council operations and about $16.8 million will go to regional providers. Uh, we are currently waiting uh, for the FTA to finalize the, the guidelines on the, this funding. Uh, and we anticipate them hopefully being able, to, being able to apply for this grant sometime late in May or early June of 2021. With this, uh, the council, we have informed the legislature that our intent for, for using these funds was, would, would be once again to balance regional transit operations. And we hope would hope to get ourselves through state fiscal years 2024 and 2025. So that would be balancing the bus operations, light rail, commuter rail, metro mobility, those family of services. So can we move to the next slide? I'd like to call on Commissioner Reinhardt, who's had her hand up for a while, and then a question also from Commissioner McDonough. Commissioner yes. Reinhardt. 
Thank you. Madam Chair, I, I would like to um, wait until the presentation is complete and then I'll have a question. Thank you, Commissioner Thank you. McDonough. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. And I know we want to hold questions, and I'll hold my general questions. But and if you could go back to the previous slide, I just got a question that's very specific to this slide here. So your your Carissa money, 185.9. I think you had about 75 was your share. 175 was your share. That seems to be buying. Um, 21 and 22 operations to get you covered. But then you indicate that, you know, the 313 or 296, that's your share of that, gets you two years too. And I'm just trying to get an understanding here. 175 buys two years, 22 and 23, but then 296 buys two years, 24 and 25. Uh Commissioner and Chair and Commissioner, very, very good question. Uh, one of the things that, um, as Mr. Koester had mentioned, the fact is that we have been managing a structural deficit for quite a few years here at the Council. One of the things that we were able to have done over the last few years is we built a significant level of reserves on both bus operations, light rail operations, commuter rail operations, metro mobility operations. So what we were able to do is with the combination of the reserves and the CRISA funds, we would spend our res council reserves down to council minimum. And then with the infusion of the CRISA funds, we were able to get ourselves through state fiscal years 22 and 23. At that point in time, council reserves would be down to minimums. We would then need, as our structural deficit then continues to move forward, we then needed the full amount of the ARP American Rescue Plan funds to move us into 24 and 25. So that's the reason 22 and 23 had the supplement with the reserves. 24 and 25 is just pure ARP funds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please continue. Okay. Thank you, Chair. So the next slide, this, this is just a quick summary of the federal relief funds. You can see we, we received uh, as a council seven, just over $725 million. So if we wanted to then move to the next slide. The next slide on slide number five gives you the breakdown that Mr. Koister had mentioned earlier. This is our anticipated forecasted breakdown through 2025 by mode of the various funds. You can see it equals the $725.8 million in the lower right-hand corner. And then we had broken out between how much we forecast to go to bus operations. This would be Metro Transit bus, contracted services, uh, and, and those types of services, $295 million. Uh, light rails is forecasted to receive $81.75 million. Then you'll see two different pieces under both bus and the light rail. It's called capital maintenance. Uh, one of the things that we have been focusing on and working on over the last few years is, or last period of time is looking at our capital maintenance needs going forward. So we're forecasting to put about $19 million into bus capital maintenance during this period of time and about $75 million towards light rail capital maintenance. Uh, you'll see commuter rails forecast to receive uh, about $3.3 million, Metro Mobility about $154 million. Then we have a, a balance of funds going to the council's fixed route service, Transit Link. As I talked about the regional providers, they get their share. It's just over $38 million from all three bondings. And then, uh, then we have the final item, which is our Transit Safety Initiative, would receive about $44.5 million to total the uh, 725 million. So as uh, Mr. Koister had mentioned, the total rail operations, will, the total light rail will receive about $171.8 million, which would be their share of, of their, their $781 million plus the piece of the capital maintenance plus their share of the transit safety initiative. Uh, that is about 23.7% uh, of the total council's receipts or about 35% of the Metro Transit receipt. Next slide. Okay, moving on to transit ridership. As Wes had mentioned, transit ridership has really been uh, a change and a story for us in 2020, moving into 2021. When we started the year in 2020, we had very good ridership the first couple months of the year. Uh, bus ridership was 5% over the 2019 levels. We saw both blue and green were running 8 to 9% above 2019 levels. 
very strong coming out of the gate in early 2020, and then the pandemic hit. So if we isolate just the pandemic months, which would be the months of April through December, that's where we saw the significant change. Our overall system went down about 71%. Uh, we saw a decrease in bus operations of about 64%. Uh, light rail went down about anywhere from about 71 to 75% during that period of time with North Star being down 96. Uh, one of the things I am pleased to report that we are seeing some slight some small movements of recovery in 2021. Uh, for example, for the week ended April 25th, which is last week, uh, we're seeing that our bus system is down about 62%. Light rail has gone down from, changed from 75%, they're down to about 65% now. A commuter rail still holds at 95% down with our system being down 64%. Uh, one of the additional analysis that we did do with the 2021 budget is we're really trying to focus on the ridership trends, the ridership trends by type of service, whether it is local service, suburban service, service or service express, LRT or uh, commuter rail. And we have forecasted right now for 2021, we forecasted that the LRT system would be down blue and green line about 62%. Some of the assumptions that we put into that was that we would have the impacts of COVID for the first six months of 2021. Then we were, we, we were building, first of all, building these ridership models about last October, November. We were hoping then that the, the impact of the, uh, the, the shots, the COVID shots of vaccines would start impacting about November, or excuse me, about June of 2021 with the reco beginning recovery with ridership in about the third, third, late third quarter, early fourth quarter of 2021. Uh, so right now we have forecasted uh, light rail ridership, both blue and green, bounced down about 62% in uh, 2021. This is pretty close. They're running about 65% now. So we feel we're, we're pretty well on target with what that original trend was. But once again, we have, we'll have to continue and watch as the year goes to see how the, how the COVID vac vaccine impacts ridership and the return to downtown ridership. So overall for the 2021 budget, uh, we have budgeted light rail green line ridership at just under 5.4 million rides next year. Next slide. Okay, well, so I'll talk, move into the 2021 operating budget for the Metro Green Line. So I'll, we'll go to the next slide. So the Metro Green Line service on slide number eight is once again, the continued service from Target Field to downtown Minneapolis and Union Depot in St. Paul. It's our 11 mile service with 23 stations with connections at the at Target Field with both Metro Blue and North Star. Uh, as we've talked about in the past, we have continued light rail overhaul programs. We always think of the Green Line service as a brand new service, but as we're running these trains, it's just like your own personal vehicle. As you continue to put the miles on them, you have to maintain your vehicle in a state of good repair, which includes where the overhauls, whether it is our brake systems, our air systems, air conditioning, all the, all the truck motors and all, the, all those types of items. Uh, we'll also do some station rehab work in, uh, in 2021, and including the floating slab replacement at the University of Minnesota. I think many of you are aware we do have a floating slab for the vibrations at the University of Minnesota. This is an item that will require maintenance about every 10 years. So we'll have our first round of major overhaul maintenance on the floating slab in 2021. So moving on to the next slide. Okay, the Metro Green Line, the 2021 operating grant in, includes service going from uh, 5 a.m. to 12 a.m. Uh, with 10 to 15 minute frequencies during the week, weekday and peaks. Uh, one of the things that we are doing though, is we are doing like, like Wes had mentioned, we're having continual service, the same level of service seven days a week. Uh, forecasting uh, weekday ridership, our average weekday about 16,500 average weekday rides next year. Uh, just under 5.4 uh, million rides with the inclusion of the CARES funds of about $10.3 million next year. Moving on to the next slide. So this is our, this is our bank of service or the bank of the, the uh, 2021 operating grant for next year. It's, it's similar to last year, but we'll talk about some of the differences. On the expense side, it's, it's virtually, it's very similar to the prior years. 
$44.7 million of expenses with about 57% of our expenses are $25 million, which is salary and benefits. As you would imagine, just like our bus service, we're a very labor intensive organization. Uh, we have propulsion costs, which is electricity to run the trains of about $1.6 million. Uh, utilities of $1.4 million. Regional allocations coming in of about $1.9 million. This is for the regional support services, which would include uh, accounts payable, uh, IS systems, human resources, all those types of major systems that we share across our, our entire council network. Uh, all of the costs, which are mainly advertising and insurance. And then we have materials and supplies of about $2.8 million, which is up a little higher due to our additional COVID cleaning that we have next year. And then we have our modal allocations of $7.8 million, which is for the shared costs that we share across the Mantra Transit system. The biggest piece of this would be police services. On the revenue side, it's similar to last year, but we do have one different, one change in there. Uh, you will see the infusion of the federal CARES funds, $10.3 million. And the next slide, when we get to that one, I'll kind of show you the differences on the, on the percentages, but we're bringing in, forecasted to bring in about $10.3 million of CARES funds. One of the things I do want to note is the fact is that that is the amount that we've allocated for 2022. If we do not spend it all, we would then, or excuse me, for 2021, if we do not spend all that $10.3 million, we would then move that into Green Line 2022 operations. Then. So it's, it's, not, it's not that we will lose it, but it's available until spent. Uh, state funds bringing in about $14.2 million, which would be 32%. Passenger fares are down about, they're down to about 13% next year at $5.8 million. Um, that's one of the things that we're watching very closely with, with, our, with our ridership. Some of the forecasting that we're doing right now, uh, that we are doing, as I mentioned, we're looking at ridership down next year, about 62%. Uh, I'm working on various funding models and forecasting models through 2025. Currently, we're forecasting, we're hoping that ridership will return to being down about 40% in 22, 25% in 23, and about 20% in 24 and 25. So those are models, Chair, that we're going to be watching very, very closely every month, every quarter to see as the impacts of COVID with the vaccines, see how true our models are. Uh, the balance of the slide, though, you'll notice then is uh, uh, we have Hennepin County funding about $8.3 million, or 19%, and Ramsey County funding $5.5 million, or 12% of the budget. The other, the small piece of other, it's called, uh, it's other, but it's mainly advertising revenue, the, the right, the, the, the trapping of our trains for revenue. So let's move to the next slide. So the next slide is basically, it is our budget comparison. This I just want to show you just a snapshot of how we looked in 2020, how we will look in 2021. And you can see the, mainly the, the biggest change is right at the top. You'll see fares in 2020 were 35%. In 2021 then, it's gone to fares at about 13%. And then the infusion of the federal funds, the CARES funds of about 23%. So you can see the change. The, the rest of the combinations of fundings are virtually the same, but you'll see the changes, the infusion of the federal funds in uh, for the loss of passenger fares. The next slide, which now brings us to the final request. Uh, this is once again consistent with the mass, consistent with the master operating funding agreement at, at the share plus 3.15 percent inflation. Uh, it would bring us to an annual operating request of $5.5 million for the operating revenues. And then you will see then the final amount, which is the non-annual share. The non-annual share is $250,000. Non-annual costs are items that are like one-time items that are non-reoccurring items, whether it is, whether it is uh, like shelter repairs, pavement, like, like pavers at the stations, all these different types of one-time items. Also included in this would be uh, would be your share of the, the floating track at the University of Minnesota. So these are just one-time reoccurring items. So it'd be for a total request then of $5,507,229 for the operations, and then your non-annual share of $250,128. Uh, for a total a 2021 grant request of $5,757,357. And with that, Madam Chair, that is the, the last slide of the presentation. And I would be, we can move to the next slide. You want to? There you go.
All right. And I would be open for any questions. Thank you so very much for your Herculean effort to get back on the line with us and for the presentation. I'm glad uh, I had my Wheaties this morning, so I was able to run down the stairs. <laughs> yes, it helps a lot. So thank you again for the presentation. We appreciate your having outlined for us the various costs and resources, how they are being applied. Uh, I know that we will have a number of questions for discussion with you this morning. We are certainly appreciative of what you've shared, but also concerned because we all know that we need the robust and connected system of transit ways. We've been working as partners uh, together here in the region to create and sustain. And of course, we have questions about our ability to do so, given what you have shared as what will be a large structural deficit, what is a large structural deficit as we move forward. We're thankful for the resources that have come to our aid as we've endured this COVID-19 depression and ridership. Uh, but it is clear that so many in our region are dependent upon these transit ways. And even as we see the local bus service uh, continually ahead in ridership because of the connections to local resources that are required for people to maintain their lives in our area. We do anticipate that we will be back, you know, that we will certainly be needing our transit ways and even more so as we come out of our response to COVID-19. Thank you. So I'm going to um, call first on Commissioner Reinhardt. Uh, to share the question that she has been holding, and then we will hear from other commissioners as well. Commissioner Reinhardt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, I am chair of the Rush Line Corridor Task Force and um, have worked very closely, obviously, with Metro Transit. Um, looking forward to the fact that we will be moving forward or going through the transition with the, with the environmental assessment uh, being due sometime within the next month or so and for publication. And so really looking forward to that um, move to um, the transition to Metro Transit for Rush Line, which will at that point become the Purple Line. <laughs> um, so it is an exciting time, but we did take a position um, uh, at Rush Line, and this goes to the issue of the governor's budget and the legislative uh, fix that you are looking to, because uh, clearly Metro Transit is a valued partner. Um, when uh, CTIB and you know everything that has been done uh, moved forward, we um, basically committed to funding for through 2053, I believe it is. And so that partnership is incredibly important. I think it's also important to note that clearly transit, as you know, is not even just a, a metro-wide uh, benefit and asset, but it is uh, statewide and it has all kinds of implications. So this is not a county issue per se. And we're willing to uh, obviously be partners in this, but uh, to shift it to us um, is really concerning and which is why we took a position at Rush Line and wrote a letter to that effect. I think it's also important to note that the commuter line, when, you, when you're quoting the numbers, you're looking at the numbers and including the commuter lines. And commuter, um, sometimes it's, it's hard for people, even for me, to say, okay, which, which, um, which lines do what? I mean, commuter means you get to and from work. So it's limited service. And yes, when people aren't going into work, that uh, significantly dropped, as you said, I think by 95% um, and continues to be there. But the lines such as Rush Line, which is bus rat rapid transit, and it has um, service beyond commuter, um, just like the local lines would um, in the inner city, um, that will actually go up. We, we need those in order to have people doing things better for um, the environment, for getting to and from doctor's appointments and different things that supply that additional mobility to people. 
So there's so much that's happening right now that is really positive. And, and honestly, going back to that, I would really like to see them broken out because when you talk about, you know, being down by 65%, I think it's important that the commuter and the regular, the rest of the service is, that is more continuous service, that that is broken apart because it, I think it skews it because commuter with, because of COVID is a big deal. So bottom line here, um, and why Rush Line took the position that it did is that we, we are affected as counties, hugely affected about the future of our lines and this regional system. And it was really, the fact that it was a surprise to us as counties is really disconcerting. Um, at the very least, why were we not brought into the discussion prior to that budget being presented to the governor. Um, when you think about partnerships, and especially when you're talking about millions of dollars, to not have been talked to about that, I think you can understand why that would be upsetting. And I'd really like to know what the response to that is. Because even the response that we got from Commissioner Zelly, I appreciate, I've, I've known Commissioner Zelly for a long time, I appreciate the work that you're doing, appreciate the work that he is doing. Um, but it certainly didn't, even that response was not one that really spoke to why were we not considered partners when it came to this most crucial, crucial issue of that structural deficit. Um, and we continue to oppose this, obviously, because it has an impact on our entire system. Thank you. Madam Chair, this is Wes Koyster. I'm speaking from my phone now. Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Koyster, we can. Sure. Um, first of all, I want, to, I want to expand on something that was, just, that was just said about the importance of continuing to focus on services like local services and, and bus rapid transit and arterial bus rapid transit. One thing we feel the that the, uh, the the COVID has the pandemic has taught us is the strength of local services and the and the resilience of of the ABRTs. They were they were certainly uh, our better performing routes to begin with, and they retained they did the best at retaining ridership. And so it's been reinforcing that we believe we're investing uh, uh, we're 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 uh, focusing our investments in the right kind of service, fast, frequent, all day service. We're that is reliable and that people know what to expect from. And we've seen in, for example, the arterial bus rapid transit's ridership grow uh, by 30%, even on high demand routes that were high demand prior to the development of those, of those services, they, they continued that demand and grew by 30%. So uh, I will say, and we've broken down uh, to the point made by the commissioner, we've broken down uh, our experience and ridership uh, uh, by those those modes and those bus bus service types, and and we present that often to our board in that break in that breakdown, and had a meeting with our transportation committee last night where we broke it down by by service. I also want to mention that during the pandemic, uh, we have, we're actually running at about 100% service on local routes uh, uh, because because of the need to provide enough service to accommodate social distancing. So while we've reduced commuter express routes down significantly, we've really maintained service levels for the most part on local routes. Uh, to the commissioner's question about the legislation, I, I know that the chair Zelly has spoken with, with commissioners about this. He's he met with you about this. And um, I can only repeat what he has said in the past. And that is that un, under the, the development of the governor's budget, there are certain periods of embargoed time and, and that, and somewhat prevents us from having the conversations we'd like to have. I also know that the Commissioner Zelly, or rather Chair Zelly, has expressed his apologies for how how awkwardly this played out, and uh, and I know that he said that uh, in more than one occasion to the to our county partners. Thank you very much. Uh, that continues to be a concern of commissioners in the metro area. I appreciate your pointing that out. Commissioner Reinhardt. I'll call on Commissioner McGuire. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a few questions just, but I'm, I'll ask a few, then I'll wait for my colleagues to ask some more and then I might have a few more, but 
Um, <clears throat> as far as the, um, you just mentioned that you maintain service on local routes, but I think on the green line, you did reduce service, right? If I'm looking at these charts during the pandemic. And so I know you said that even though, you, you know, that you do need to do maintenance on a car like you do on the lines, but if you don't use your car, like we didn't use the, the, the trains on, on such a regular basis, I'm just wondering um, if the costs were still the same, even if you, didn't, if you didn't use them as much. So I know you still have to maintain them, but it looks like the price stayed the same. And so I was hoping you could give me a better breakdown of that. Sure, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, um, we we have adjusted service levels uh, that are uh, at us uh, uh, really at weekday le uh, weekend service levels during the weekdays, and and as I mentioned before, that that, that adjustment was made in part uh, because uh, uh, we're seeing ridership patterns that really really replicate weekend services where there is that peak in the in at the end of the at the end of the day that really what that really means is moving from 10 minute frequency in the early morning hours and the late evening hours to 15 minute frequency and having 10 minute frequency more from the hours of i'm going to say generally from nine to four or five in the afternoon uh where where we have our peak where we have our peak ridership we're hoping that we can return back to 10 minute frequency we're hoping the demand rises to the point where we can turn back but what we've done with the fund, with the funds that we do have, as you mentioned, a number of fixed costs. But what we've done with with the funding that was that was saved is moved it towards our efforts to improve uh, security and 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 uh, safety and the cleanliness of the vehicles. We continue to have to uh, 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 provide do disinfecting of the vehicles on a daily basis. Uh, we're we're going to be adding. Um, uh, personnel a presence on light rail uh, 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 that will there will be a non-police presence where we've added uh, personnel to we've we've um, added uh, real-time cameras on all our light rail but uh, our light, light rail cars and now we're adding resources to our real-time information center that monitors those those cameras uh, we're also adding uh, police service that that includes um, uh, an, uh, a response team that as we see more, we're going to have to provide more police response. So it's really a combination of non-sworn officer presence on light rail. It's a, it's, it's additional staffing for a real-time information center to take full advantage of the real, of the real-time cameras. And then it's making sure that we have uh, the resources to respond to concerns as we become more aware of them uh, that occur on the, on the light rail. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, so what you're, what I'm think, what I think I heard you say. So it costs may have gone. I mean, maintenance costs might have gone down a little bit because we're not running them quite as often. But the other costs went up, so it it evens itself out a little bit. Is that what I'm hearing you say? But if we could get that more defined, that would be great. So we would know like what are you putting into all of those extra things that even itself out because maintenance would be a little would be less because of the less num the less uh, times that the trains are running. But, I, and so if, if we could get that, that would be great. And then the other question I have is a bigger picture question in that we're gonna see people's work patterns change, I think for per permanently. Like people are just gonna be working from home a lot more and things. So um, are, you, are you, what are your, how are you thinking about that in the future for all of these lines? I mean, I know it's something we're all thinking about, like how, or how, what, what's your plan for assessing all of that and how you're thinking about that? Yeah, Madam Chair and, and, and Commissioner, that's a great question. And it's a question that every transit agency is struggling with right now. Mm -hmm. and, and I will say it, we're kind of working in the dark. You know, as you know, nobody's ever been through this before. But you can, you can in a common sense way, say that the, the, the travel behavior is going to change uh, based upon how work environments change. No one knows to what extent uh, that is going to occur. If you ask the question today, you'll get one answer. But am I, I would guess if you ask the question a year from now, the answer might be a little different. But let's just assume 
uh, that we're going to see less 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 commuter uh, uh, peak time, you know, formerly nine to five peak time um, uh, patterns of, of travel of travel uh, that that's going to be reduced. Uh, just as context, our peak time travel is is about. 30% of our total ridership across our entire system. Uh, and I'm talking bus, rail, commuter rail together. Um, that, that um, if, if it, so, so sometimes people view that as our only service. We provide, we provide uh, rides to and from work throughout the day, you know, and, the, and the, those that most rely on our service are those uh, that are essential on-site employees. We, that, that's what we discovered during during this period of time. But even if we, if we look just at the commuter uh, peak times of nine between the nine to five commuter peak times, uh, one can one can say if it, if it gets reduced by half, that's a fifty percent change in our in our ridership. Uh, so it, so I mention that because not necessarily this this board, but other groups feel like that commuter. Uh, peak times were our primary ridership load, and that just was not, that's just not the case. That said, to get more at your question, what we're looking at is what opportunities does that bring to us to invest more services in, in, um, in, in the routes where there is higher demand and higher reliance, create greater frequency in local routes and local suburban routes, create greater frequency um, expand uh, our ABRT models and, and, and invest in those. So I think that as we know more, there's going to be discussions about how does that give us opportunities to invest in services that are that really have been proven to be ideal models for ridership growth and ideal models that really serve people who will rely on transit to the greatest extent. Because transit really is... Uh, uh, an important mobility op mobility option for so many people, and I think I think there's opportunity in these changes. We I'm just going to be really frank with you and say, I can't really predict how those changes are going to play out yet. And all my colleagues and other agencies will tell you the same thing. We'll be watching very closely, but that's kind of how we're thinking about it. I I, I appreciate that, and thank you for that. And I just going to echo what I think all of my colleagues on this board and I think everywhere feel is that we want to, we would, we really want to be part of those discussions as you move forward and make those decisions that we do consider ourselves partners with you. And we want to be partners early on, not just brought in at the, you know, at the funding level or, you know, at the request level, we really want to be part of the, of the process. So just, um, uh, want, you know, want you to keep that in mind that we, we definitely want to be at the table early on. Thank you. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, we appreciate that and I hear that clearly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for reiterating that, Commissioner McGuire, as I am certain that you will continue to hear that from members of this board and as we are in contact and relationship with others across the region from our other partners as well and the partner on this line in particular, Hennepin County who we understand had substantial discussion with you as well. I'll call on Commissioner Ortega. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Wes and Ed for the presentation. I guess I just wanna make a statement more than questions because I, I uh, you know, we've seen this presentation uh, <laughs> annually. So it, there's not much difference except for the cares money. What I would like to see as we move forward in our conversations, especially over the structural uh, debt, is I like to see the whole picture. In other words, I wanna see the whole system, the whole transit system, so we could have a really good discussion. Because right now, all we're talking about is the green line and our share of debt. Uh, and then you wanna use our sales tax to make up your structural difference. And what I want to see is the entire system. That's what we, when we were together on the CTIP, we would look at the whole picture. And if we're going to be uh, good partners and come up with a good solution, a, a solution we all could work with, then we need to see all the pieces of your budget. And what you're really showing us now is a pie chart and, and some numbers. I like, to, I like to say, so we could have some good discussion about how do we, how do we make uh, balance the books? How do we uh, 
How do we pay for the services that are needed by the people? Because the issue, the bottom line is, how do we serve most of the people that need to, that are transit dependent? And they're going to have to be tough decisions in this blanket, uh, you know, let's take a, a piece of the sales tax of uh, every county or however we come to it isn't, just, isn't going to work. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense for us because we don't look at it as just the green line. We look at it as the whole system. Our folks need to get to work to different parts of the metro area. Uh, and we need to see how all of that connects. So I, it's just a statement that if we're going to really have a conversation, I'm not going to have a two-hour conversation over a pie chart of the green line. I want to have a conversation looking at all the pieces of the transit system. Thank you. Tony, you're on mute. My apologies, trouble getting back to the button. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Ortega. I have Commissioner McDonough. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, I've got a few things I'll touch base on. First, I wanna just go back to the conversation that um, Commissioner McGuire brought up and, and the response on um, ridership and its relationship to frequency. I mean, there's a reason why the, a, the arterial BRT held its own and that's really because of the frequency ridership is attached so much to frequency and dependency and i know that's kind of like a chicken or egg piece here but um without frequency we will not regain that ridership and so we've got to continue to invest in that frequency there's a reason why you know the green line and the blue line are 25 percent of all your rides right because uh 10 minute headways and then people don't need a schedule and they can just walk up and get on so I just wanted to really highlight uh, the importance of frequency and the investment in that frequency to help drive that ridership, especially the recovery of, of the ridership as we move forward here. So um, one thing that's really concerning to me, and this is kind of really kind of want to go a little deeper here on uh, Commissioner Ortega's comments. If, I go, if you go back to slide five, where you're laying out your five-year projections for uh, the allocation of the federal funding. And this is the, the piece that's really concerning to me in relationship to the structural deficit. We know that you've had that a long time. And I mean, that occurs because the state and the legislature does not want to help allocate dedicated funding for our transit system to operate in the way that most transit systems do. So you're dependent on that legislature every year to be able to fund your system. And, and that's a problem. We all agree with that. We want to work with you on that. But one thing that's really concerning in your projections here, and I'm going to go to the Metro Mobility line that year 23, 24, you are projecting to alleviate the state of its responsibilities for Metro Mobility. And if there's one part of this budget that is really a statewide responsibility is the Metro Mobility piece. And it's concerning that by the time we get to, to uh, years 24 and 25, you're over almost $50 million of the Metro Mobility budget you're utilizing for federal funding, which does not already, your decisions have been made about how that federal funding can help all the funding partners be able to participate here moving forward. And so, you know, to Raphael's questions, this is all integrated. And, you know, I have to make it clear here not only to West, to you and your team and, and Met Transit, but to my colleagues, I'm not prepared to move forward on, on this proposal here. There's just too many unanswered questions. You know, we've got the governor rolling out his proposal to shift all the costs to counties without any cost for conversations with us. He's walked that back some, but it's still in the Senate bill. So we've got a lot of unanswered questions here about how this ends up with the final deal. 
you know, hopefully in May. Um, and that's going to have an impact on, you know, decisions that we make, not only as a county board, Ramsey County, but with our partner Hennepin, another major funder in this partnership here of this transit system. And, um, you know, again, to Raphael's point, it's more than just a conversation about this year. It's a conversation about how we move forward, you know, over the next five years here and what that looks like and what's our, what are those cost shares and how do we help support each other to provide as robust transit services as we possibly can to the residents, not only of Ramsey County, but our region here. So, um, you know, as we continue this conversation, I certainly see a few more hands up and I'm interested in other conversations. I just, I think we've got more work to do here, uh, Wes, and Ed, about what this agreement looks like. And, and we need some time here to, to uh, sort that out with you folks. Thanks, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, if I could respond. Please go ahead. First of all, I, I want to express agreement with the commissioner about, uh, about needing to have more stable support from, from whatever source, but certainly the, the state when it comes to Metro mobility, because it's a, it's a mandated service and we have no choice but to provide it. I believe there are, uh, in, on both sides, there's some language that, are, that, that may be directed towards um, uh, making Metro mobility a forecasted program. And while, and I, that would certainly be a benefit to to our outlook, our long-term outlook, because Metro mobility is, is a mandated service for a good reason. It serves people with disabilities. It serves people with no other mobility choices, but it's, it's a service that's growing significantly. And so, and it's an expensive service that's, that's growing significantly. So, you know, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. I would just say as to our grant request today, that this isn't a request to approve our entire plan. It's a request to approve operating funds uh, that we need to continue services uh, throughout throughout this year. And I think that I, I'm not suggesting that that's not understood by the commissioners. And I don't mean that disrespectfully in any way. But I, I think it's important uh, to be to state that we're requesting for for operating for operations funds for services that we're providing today. We're we're requesting operations funds. Uh, that will help us uh, improve security and safety uh, on, on light rail. If we do not get approval of the operating funds, uh, we're reaching the point where we're going to run into cash flow deficits that we have to go into our board to go into negative, negative cash flow, and it creates another set of requests that we have to make. So um, I just think it's, you know, certainly uh, 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 I'm not, not suggesting I'm, I'm not suggesting that this is something that this board doesn't know, but I think it's important to stay for the record uh, that, we're, that our request is for operating grants for Green Line. I appreciate the interest of the board, uh, the broader interest of the board in the, trans, in the transit system as a whole. I appreciate it because we need partnerships who have a broader interest in the transit system as a whole because we've been confronting transit this transit issue of structural deficit for too long. And it's really hard to deliver a stable, consistent service when you look, keep looking at deficits in the next year. So that partnership in how we address those very difficult issues. And I will say we've gone to the state with a, with a funding request for, for, uh, um, for a sales tax, probably at least three occasions or maybe four occasions. We've done it when there's been uh, certainly split houses. We've done it when there's, when there's been DFL controlled house Senate and, and the, and governor, uh, governor's office, and we've never been successful. I hope that that's not, that's not a prediction of the future, but just so you know, we have put those requests forward to, uh, uh, to the, to the legislature and will likely continue to do that and welcome your support. But for this today, we're asking support, uh, for a grant request of a service that's already running. And I just want to make that clear. It's really, this funding is really important to us. It's important to delivering the service. Thank you, Commissioner McDonough, were you done? We do appreciate your response and the funding of course, to us as partners in the long term um, is critical. We understand that and we are partners in ensuring that the entire comprehensive system is supported and sustainable for the future. As partners, we appreciate that while we are here, 
to talk about the 2021 period and the fund, the specific funding request. Uh, we also understand that our operating agreement will conclude at the end of 2022 and the implications for what we see as a structural deficit are clearly needing to be understood and worked out with comprehensive solutions beyond our turning to our property taxpayers or our sales tax as the point of um, resort. And so as partners, we want to emphasize that today, it does have implications for the action that we are being asked to take in approving this 2021 expense as it is a part of the uh, agreement that expires in 2022. And as we need to understand a framework for moving forward then as partners to determine what will happen beyond and how the many decisions that need to be made will be made. So we appreciate your being here to hear us today and to think about the work that we have to do together as partners for the future. I have Commissioner Modest Castillo on board and then Commissioner Freckham, Commissioner Mattis Castillo. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I appreciate the presentation and um, an overview. There's one area that I see missing uh, in the presentation and so just had questions about, and, and that is about the issue of homelessness. So, you know, um, prior to the pandemic, we were coming together as regional partners at the table to talk about the issue of homelessness and people who are experiencing uh, homelessness on the transit system and where there are partners and opportunities um, to gather and, and Met Transit was at the table and then the pandemic hit and we closed things down and we booted people outside and then we, we really struggled um, alone as a county and a city uh, along with Hennepin County to, to um, address the needs and, and your absence was noted in that uh, particular situation. And, and so I'm wondering on, you know, what role the Met Transit uh, is going to play moving forward in that regional partnership? Because I, I know it's not specific to whether we're moving uh, trains and buses, but it is a, a part of who we're serving in our community as we talked a lot about people who are transit dependent, where I can tell you our unsheltered population is very transit dependent. Um, you talked about increasing funds for more policing, but you didn't talk about partnership or good uh, community engagement. And so I'm just wondering if you can address that as well. Madam Chair and Commissioner, that's a, that's a great question. And um, uh, let me just say that we have, we have significant challenges with, with people using transit as shelter. I'm not talking about people who are homeless or using transit for mobility from one location to another, but using transit is uh, for shelter. I will say this, uh, in, in my past experience, I once served as the assistant commissioner for the Department of Human Services for Mental Health and Chemical Dependency, and I care deeply about this issue. And I've been engaged very in, in very, very real ways in trying to improve service delivery for people with mental illness and chemical dependency. Uh, this can be a long discussion. I'll let me try to figure out how to be concise. Uh, I, we do have uh, we have a homeless action team uh, on our on our uh, police force who is there to connect people to services. I will say we work closely with our HRA in that regard and have alle and have allocated uh, I, over over two hundred vouchers for people who are using transit as shelter uh, to provide shelter for those individuals. And we have so far placed over 400 individuals through that connection between that we've created between our homeless action team and uh, and our HRA. Over 400 individuals. That said, these are individuals that can be that we hope can be and we believe can be successful in traditional shelter saving settings with minimal services. What we discovered during the pandemic, when individuals were being placed in hotels and motels and other locations, that there were plenty of placements for people, but many of the individuals using transit as, sh as shelter uh, were not willing to go to those other, to those other locations because they, their lifestyle were not conducive 
to a traditional shelter. And these are, and I'm going to say, say things in generalities, and I don't mean to diminish the individuality of anybody that is on, that is homeless and is on our service, but for a large part, uh, these individuals are individuals severe and persistent mental illness. These are individuals with 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 uh, significant substance abuse, and most often co-occurring. And they need specialized services. Transit is not a social service provider. You don't want transit to be a social service provider, but we are. We do want to be a partner in connecting people to the right services. We desperately need stronger relationships. And we appreciate, by the way, the relationship we've had with the Ramsey in the past, because the Ramsey really has been a good partner, but we rely on that partnership. These are individuals that, that need, it, we, we tend to approach the issue of homelessness with saying people just simply need homes. These are people who need services. These are individuals who need treatment. They don't need jails, they need treatment. And, and I think that that, that that partnership between Metro Transit and counties is really important in that regard. Now I will say our other riders don't view it in this in this way. They don't always view it in this way because they that makes them uncomfortable and makes them feel uh, a lack of safety and we get a lot of feedback in that regard. But part of part of this and I'm, I've lost my being concise so I apologize. Uh, part of this issue uh, is that there's no dignity in people using tr transit as shelter. There's no running water there's no restrooms. Uh, there's there's no hygiene facilities. Uh, there's no there's no treatment. There's no services. There is no dignity. There's got to be a better solution, and I agree wholeheartedly that that solution is one that that it really relies on the partnership of our of our organization with County Social Services, who has from from my from from my experience, who has a very strong role and significant responsibilities in service delivery in this area. Thank you, Wes. I, I'm glad to hear that that partnership is as important to you as it is to us in, um, in this area. I, I have one other, you know, kind of comment follow on to Commissioner McDonough's comment about Metro Mobility. And I know that it is a, a mandated uh, a service, but I, you know, words matter and the way that we talk about people who have uh, disabilities um, or need require that service, you know, to me, it really sounds like it, it, it might be mandated, but it isn't a burden, right? It is, that is the service in which we are here to provide to make sure everyone, and as we know, people with uh, disabilities, it, it's a growing population, especially as people are aging and other things, life events occur. Um, that we need to grow it. And I, I really hope that into the future that Met Transit uh, takes a look at it as not as one, a one off or one more thing we have to do, but that we actually design a transit system that is built for people with disabilities because it will work for all of us. And I think it would save on the long-term budgeting and cost burden if we think about how are we increasing our transit system completely to be more inclusive as opposed to oh yeah, we have to now add this other thing for other people. So just just a comment there, but thank you, Madam Chair. Ma Madam Chair, uh, I'd like just to mention on the issue of Metro Mobility that I think we're in full agreement on that. In fact, as we're looking at, a, at our strategic framework going forward, one of the areas we're focusing on is accessibility for all people with all, with all needs. And we certainly have a program where we're trying to, to provide, uh, to better meet the ADA requirements. That's an emphasis that we're doing. And I, I know it's also about route design and service design as well. I'll mention the reason that we, uh, uh, I used the term mandated was not, not to diminish the importance of the service, but frankly, to reinforce, and this is coming again, probably from my human services background, that when you, when the typically mandated services for people who have, who have uh, 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 healthcare needs or other presenting disability uh, needs have been forecasted programs when you're in the healthcare arena, and so when you're in the uh, when you're in the metro transit arena in the transportation arena, the uh, I guess I'm trying to make the point of, of if they're mandated services, maybe these also should be forecasted services, and that would that would really go a long ways towards what you're talking about and your vision of how we approach this. 
Thank you very much, Commissioner Castillo, and for the response as well. I have on deck Commissioner Fretham. I'll call on Commissioner Fretham. It appears as though we'll be in a position then to determine how we will move forward on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair Carter, uh, and, and thank you for our Met Council uh, reps here today for this conversation. I want to first note that I, um, hearing, hearing your response on the fact that here at the county and other counties, we, we weren't um, able to be informed ahead of time on the legislative proposal and the embargo time, I think all of us, even in my short time here, we've also had that situation occur where it's damaged relationships with our other local uh, government partners. So I hear you there. Um, I, I'm wondering more if some of that frustration isn't about that the proposal itself exists and that it's one that would have been thought of as reasonable. Um, I also hear you on the question, as, as Commissioner McDonough noted, the potential of wanting some more time and maybe not feeling prepared to vote today and your response that what we're voting on today um, as you know a standalone item versus this larger conversation that we really wanna have and just noting my agreement that this ongoing conversation is really necessary. Um, so with that, I, I wanna ask, um, you know, what is the deadline or what is the timeline for Met Council's needs in terms of when this specific request needs to be approved that won't create um, additional burdens for you as an organization? Um, what additional time can we have to resolve unanswered questions without creating a negative impact on this specific request moving forward? Um, and and I'll, I'll loop back and repeat this uh, because sometimes I need to ramble for a second. Uh, so I'll, I'll reiterate my question at the end. Um, and I think one of the questions that, that we're hearing and issues that are coming up is that legislative session is still happening. We have concerns about that language remaining in the Senate bill and what impacts that might have on us to consider this request. Um, and then again, um, more specifically, other than just you know legislative impacts in general, you noted um, safety and security initiatives. I'm wondering if you can speak directly to how safety and security initiatives that are currently under discussion at the legislature relate to these projected capital maintenance and operational costs. Um, I, so, so those are the, the two things I'd like to speak on, you to respond to directly, timeline and the safety and security initiatives and potentially any other legislative impacts. Um, but in general, I just want to add and reiterate that the burden of transit expense, although county, you know, as a county, we want to play our part, we recognize and value um, transit as an integral part of the infrastructure of our economy and life here in Ramsey County, but that um, Ramsey County residents aren't the sole users or benefiters of these services that take place in Ramsey County. Um, you know, we've already heard earlier in this session a discussion of some of the recovery funds of the way the metro area drives economics uh, and the economy of the entire state and how greater Minnesota benefits from our robust economy and our robust economy does not exist in the cities without robust transit. And that in addition to that, e even looking in our metro area, you know, my previous job, my coworker took Metro Transit almost every day to work. She lived in Anoka County. She drove to Ramsey County for a park and ride to get to her job in Ramsey County. So the idea that our greater metro area shouldn't play a role in supporting that because it is what, you know, gets people out uh, to those uh, greater suburban areas because they have access to transit into the job hubs that we have. And to Commissioner Reinhardt's point about the environmental concerns, I mean, we obviously, as a personal choice using transit, there's an environmental gain. And we talk a lot about the systemic choice. And as Commissioner McDonough has said a few times today, that the importance of access and ease that you need to have that reliability, um, that, that we want that because of the broader systemic impact uh, of greater transit use. But even more than that, you know, if, if Ramsey County has to bear a disproportional brunt of the cost of that transit system, we have no other means but to pass those costs onto our residents. So then we get into this catch 22, where 
our residents may decide, well, I'm going to move out then to Anoka County or Washington County or Dakota County, uh, which then increases their own cost because they won't have access to that robust transit out there. We can't provide it here. And now we they are driving their cars into their jobs in the city. And it's, it's increasing the overall cost, not only on our environment, but our roads. Um, so there we can't just look at the immediate individual impacts of transit service. There are broader systemic issues and robust transit here in Ramsey County and Hennepin County in the metro area supports our entire state. So there is a state obligation here. Uh, and, and I think that larger conversation is important. Uh, so now that I've, I've said my piece and rant, the specific questions I asked are, what's, what's your deadline? What, what time can we have to get around some of our, our unanswered questions so we can feel comfortable voting on this specific proposal? And then if you could specifically speak to um, in connection with that deadline and timeline we may wanna have that we are tracking legislation right now and that there are things being discussed and specifically safety and security initiatives being discussed and how that might, it might impact uh, this specific proposal and that timeline. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Let me, uh, let me give a shot at this. At this, give me a shot at those questions, and I'll, and I'll ask uh, Mr. Petrie to, to correct. I believe that we start running into negative cash flow in early May. That's under correct. that under under that time frame, um, we would probably be talking to our management committee about going. I don't know what how you define burden. We may define that differently, but when we got going into negative cash flow, it means we're borrowing from other funds to to keep services on the street. And we probably have to have that discussion in the first management committee of May. I haven't had that. I was we we're frankly hoping these grants would be approved. So so I haven't I, I've looked at this generally, but haven't looked at it in specificity. But I'm I imagine we'll have to have that discussion in the first management committee in May, which is um, I believe in about two weeks from, from Wednesday, I'd have to look, please don't hold me that I have to have to look for at the calendar, uh, uh, on that, but that's generally the pattern. The second Wednesday of the month would be You're the first day, the correct. first management committee, um, with respect to, um, with, res I'll just, with respect to the issue of how safety is playing a role in the budget. Uh, the governor has proposed the administrative citations bill and a safety initiative to 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 the uh, um, to the legislature. Provisions for that bill are in the House position, are supported by the House position, and uh, and not in the Senate position. Although the, it received a positive vote, uh, a bipartisan vote in the Senate Transportation Committee, and there's not been a negative vote on it in the Senate. It's only been omitted from the Senate position. And some of the conversations going along there have been that they feel like there's some, there's a possibility that it can be come to agreement. This is really important because it moves moves uh, fair citations from a, from a criminal misdemeanor to an administrative citation like a parking ticket, which it, which it, which it should be. The other piece of that though, is a safety piece of that. And, and, and that comes in two ways. One is it's putting more people who are not sworn officers because sworn officers, frankly, may mean safety to some people, but may not always mean safety to other people. And we think we just need to have more of an official presence. And by having more people there checking fares who are not sworn officers, which is what's required now, uh, will really not only be a more effective mechanism for fare evasion, but will also be a more effective uh, mechanism of having a more of an official presence on our on our transit system. It's widely supported and it's been done in other cities. And so we're, we're really looking forward to that. It also includes, though, having, as I mentioned before, other other uh, additional staff in that are that would not be on the on the uh, rail system itself, but additional police officers and civilian staff watching real-time ca uh, cameras for criminal behavior. We think this is a force multiplier without having to have a visible force, pres greater force presence. And, and then we have uh, other individuals that would, that would be available to respond to crimes as they're being observed or they're being reported uh, 
by the individuals who are, who are non-sworn officers on our, on our transit system. All that said, the fund, the, the governor's asked us to fund that with, with the, with, with the federal funds that we're receiving for the first, for the first, um, for the coming biennium and the, and the, and the uh, planning uh, biennium that follows. Uh, that funding doesn't start until starts phasing in uh, uh, later. And so what we're using this money for is, is, is to get started immediately with, with those activities and get started immediately with those investments and address some of the, some of the real concerns we're hearing about safety uh, on, on light rail and crime on light rail. So we're trying to get a head start with this money uh, and and then I think it gets again. Then I think it gets um, uh, moved into funding by the federal relief, so we can back off of the use of, of the other funds. And then I hopefully backing off. This is this is best laid plans, but backing off of, of the other funds may come at, at a time where we can start increasing service again and, and reinvest into those service frequencies. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not. And, uh, for the most part, I, I guess the if you're if we're looking at you would have to go to someone in the second Wednesday of the month if we were to potentially say lay this over and and come back to this next week, it sounds like that would not that that you would have what you need in time without having to make additional requests then and would could could potentially give us a bit more time to resolve any unanswered questions and i won't speak for my other commissioners i'm just looking at trying to determine what the options are yeah Thank madam you. chair I, uh, uh commissioner um i would i would just say that that we have to start that conversation because of negative because uh, of, of of requirements when we go into negative cash flow uh the second Wednesday of May, how that plays into your timing. Uh, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not acquainted with that. Thank you. It's helpful to hear uh, what parameters exist there as we determine how, in fact, we are going to move forward here today. I'll call on Commissioner McDonough. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I'm going to make one quick comment on the access piece and Commissioner Fretham's example, and she was tying it to the environmental piece when folks lose access, her example is they jump in their car and they can go, oh, I can tell you most of us represent huge po populations that don't have that option. So access is just as much about inclusion as it is access. And when the green line went from, you know, 23, 24 hour service to, you know, shutting down at midnight, that had an impact on many of our folks that depend on that for access to jobs. When bus service is reduced, it's not just about getting into a car. It's about how do I keep my job? How can I keep my education opportunity going? How do I get my kids to childcare so that I can take care of my parents or whatever? So it's more than just access. It's about inclusion and ensuring that we meet the needs of all in our community. I really appreciate the conversation. I think we've had an opportunity to touch base on so many things here. Trista brought it up the homeless piece, the access piece. You know, Raphael brought up this bigger picture piece, and I think that's really important. I'm going to make a motion that we table this. My understanding is Hennepin County also tabled it. I'm not going to do time specific for when this re would return. I'm just going to make a motion that we would table it and have further conversations with Hennepin County and, and Metro Transit on coming to agreement on how we move forward on this operating proposal for 2021. And I would hope we would have the opportunity to have a larger conversation here. We are 50% uh, of the non-passenger fare revenue in operations here for this light rail line, um, and, which is identical to the state. And I know it's hard when you've got other partners that are funding partners, but we are more than just a bank here. We are a partner in the operations of this white rail line, this green line, to ensure that it's meeting our needs. So with that, I would move that we table it. I would hope these conversations would happen quickly and we can get back here quickly. But 
I don't have my preferences. We don't dictate when it comes back. Let's let the process determine when it can come back to us. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to table to a non-specific time to allow time for the conversations that need to be held between our partners and better understand how we will move forward together toward the comprehensive transportation system that we all want and need. Um, understanding this will need to move um, to allow for our completion of approval of this specific time period. I am going to ask then that we vote on this motion. We'll then talk about how it would come back to us. So again, we have a non-debatable motion to table. <coughs> And I will call on our clerk to call the roll. Reinhardt? Aye. Fretham? Fretham? Nay. Mattis Castile? Aye. McDonough? Excuse me, McDonough? Aye. McGuire? Aye. Ortega? Aye. Carter? Aye. Thank you very much. The ayes have it and the motion to table moves forward. It is understandable that there are time parameters around which we will need to be conscious. And so we will ask for our partners uh, to work with us coordinating together to ensure that we're able to have the necessary conversation. The motion tabled will come back to us as an administrative item on our agenda and be posted as such, as we are able to ensure those conversations are satisfactorily held. Um, once again, we in approving this motion, want to share how much we appreciate that you are before us, that you've given us the opportunity to hear the presentation, acknowledging our need to move forward in addressing the annual uh, funding that is needed as we are in the operating year. We also appreciate that you've been able to hear from us uh, consensus of concerns around our partnership and our need to understand the decision making process as we invest in the services and the capital needs uh, to ensure that system that we are all relying on for the future. So we're thankful that you've heard our discussion today we all understand the urgency of the conversation and we will be in touch to ensure that it will occur and that we will see this back on our administrative agenda so that we are able to move the action forward. Uh, I will turn back to our Met Council participants again, Mr. Koistra and Mr. Petrie, thanking you for the presentation and asking for any final comments. Madam Chair, we've we've had plenty of time to speak, so I just want to thank you for having us today. Much thank appreciation. You. Before you depart, I see Commissioner McDonough's hand up. Just want to make sure that that is not left over. It is. And once again, thank you so much. I also had and plenty of time to speak to them. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. So with great appreciation, then we're moving on to the balance of our agenda. Thank we thank you. Thank you very much. We've got substantial um, agenda left. And so I will call now on Commissioner McGuire for the legislative update. We have mm -hmm. in-county connections uh, to hear regarding National County Government Month and we'll have our outside board and committee reports prior to our adjournment. Commissioner McGuire. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh just like to start out by thanking our government relations team of Jen Jennifer O'Rourke and Melissa Finnegan and uh, Commissioner Mattis Castillo and myself. Of course, Ethan Osten and Melissa Jamrick are also on, on those calls. Um, while they're in the they're in the omnibus bill stage of, of the, the legislative session and uh, the bills have been going through both of the bodies, the, uh, the Senate still has to do the tax bill as well as health and human services, but otherwise the House has, has seen both of those. Conferees are being appointed, and 
uh, given the seniority and the number of chairs that we have uh, in Ramsey County legislators, we have a number of people on the conference committee. So we're excited about that and we'll be, in, we'll be keeping in touch with them to remind them about what our priorities are in their specific uh, issue area so that they can um, work, work in partnership with us um, on that. And they have been very um, open. To, they're, they're very supportive of doing that. So we were grateful for our legislative partners. Um, government relations staff covering a number of fiscal of issues, fiscal and policy that are in those bills, as I've said. And just a couple of other examples that they're following, more business assistance aid and homeless prevention aid that is in the tax bill. So lots of issues that we're following. So uh, the public safety bill has gotten a lot of attention and just to um, let you know that the Senate had promised to have hearings on that public safety bill, but they, uh, this, this included accountability ability measures that were included in the House provision. Uh, they've decided to let that now be resolved in the conference committee. Not the most ideal for the public input, but it is what the Senate decided to do that they're gonna let those uh, really important issues of accountability be, be involved in or be handled in a conference committee, not in a general uh, public hearing. So um, then uh, the big news of the day is news that you've all heard, but we're very excited that the census results are in and we are able to keep all eight of our congressional offices. This is a really big news. It's a really big deal. And a great credit goes to all of the people in our state and county that really worked on making sure that our numbers were counted. We had, we had a big effort in that. I'm gonna, I know Commissioner Reinhardt has her hand up and just thanks so much. She served on our, on our, our count committee, but I wanna, I'm gonna ask, she'll, she'll be commenting, but uh, it was by just a very few votes that we were able to keep our seats. So that's why every vote counts. I think it was like 89, maybe Commissioner Reinhardt has the exact number, but what a deal that is. Every vote counted in this and every effort mattered in this event. And this is a big deal because it allows us to uh, have a greater extent of federal funding, a greater extent on all of our issues of federal uh, participation. So uh, with that, uh, we're continuing to work with Representative McCollum's office on a lot of other issues that she's got, that we've got going on uh, with, community, with appropriations and transportation infrastructure bills. So um, uh, with that, we'll, we'll just keep our keep uh, working on, on, those, uh, on those issues. But anyways, I'm, I'm excited that Victoria, that Commissioner Reinhardt has her hand raised because I'd like her to comment. Thank you very much, Commissioner McGuire. We'll call on Commissioner Reinhardt, our complete count chair. Um, and knowing that we're moving quickly through as we have guests mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Reinhardt. Thank you. Yes, very exciting news. And <laughs> it was by 89. And I know that you were saying votes because we're used to dealing with votes, oh, but it was sorry. individuals that were counted. Thank you. And yeah. each individual um, makes a difference, um, especially I mean, when you look at this. This is about our overall uh, representation at the federal level, but also the proportionate uh, representation at all levels in the, in, uh, the state and county. Um, I want to thank... Uh, Council Member Mitra Jalali, the St. Paul City Council Member Mitra Jalali and I were co-chairs of the Joint Committee. And I, I'm not gonna go into all of the staff, but, uh, but I do wanna call out uh, Jolie Wood from Ramsey County and Claire Verbetten from the City of St. Paul. There were a lot of people that were involved in this. And I have to tell you, um, this, is, this was the most robust community engagement process I have ever seen. And so we are, I, we are very proud and I think that um, the, the real kudos go to all of the members, especially of, of Ramsey County's, as I said, very vibrant uh, community involvement and ideas that came forward. Um, 89 individuals um, makes a difference between Minnesota having one additional federal uh, representative is amazing and uh, kudos to, to all involved. So I wanted to make sure that I especially called out 
um, the folks that really said, let's, let's think outside the box this time. And we did, and it worked. Thank you so much yeah. to all who participated in making sure that every vote counts. Um, mm -hmm. Commissioner just, McGuire, did you just have one to, more thing? Just to thank Commissioner Reinhardt for clarifying that it's not votes, it's counted, it's people counted. So thank you for, for clarifying that really. And it was all the efforts that people made to make sure that people got counted. So thank you for clarifying that. Thank you so much for the report on our legislative update. I want to now turn to our deputy county manager in place of County Manager O'Connor, who is here with a special update on how everyone counts, and in particular, some of our youngest during this County Government Month. Director Hadid, Deputy County Manager Hadid. Thank Madam you. Chair, thank you. Um, and I extend the congratulations to the entire team uh, with the census as well. That's amazing work that was done. Um, at the end of Counties Matter Month, we wanted to focus on youth and young adult work, um, as well as our early childhood work that's been taking place. And so I will hand it over to Director Ling Becker first, and she will also invite uh, Commissioners McGuire and Fretham to follow. Yeah, good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Um, thank you for having us here at the end here. Um, as uh, Deputy County Manager Hadeen mentioned this is uh, NACO's designated Counties Matters Month in April and certainly throughout the pandemic we've seen over and over again the critical role that counties do play and while it would be very difficult to represent the work of 4,000 employees I would like to take this opportunity to highlight uh, three particular things that have been happening around youth young adults and our early childhood efforts um, first, I'd like to introduce, and I hope they can hop onto the call, uh, Rachel Molnar and Valerie Su, who um, supported this project. Rachel is a planner in Workforce Solutions, and Valerie is a communications associate in our communications department, and they helped um, and were an integral part of this project that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, last December, commissioners, many of you joined us for a meeting with young adults who receive workforce care funding. Um, through uh, various programming. One of the things that they told you was that uh, there was a, a, a desire for more accessibility for youth resources um, through the county. And so in partnership with uh, Marcus Jackson, um, Thomas Nelson, and Devin White, I believe they're all here with us today. I hope you can turn your monitors on. Um, they served as con consultants to us as we um, started to make some improvements in this area. So first I'm gonna show you the site and then hopefully um, they'll have a chance to share with you as well. So um, I think we can get that site up. Um, so the site is a, a web page that really focuses on youth and young adult resources. Uh, we aim to have more accessible and quicker access for resources. It's in a very similar format as our COVID-19 page, highlighting things like uh, basic needs, employment, health and healing, homelessness resources. But what we heard from the young people was that our previous site required a lot of navigation and a lot of clicking. And so we attempted to pull out the sites, the information and resources that they felt themselves and all their other friends and um, connections felt would be most valuable and tried to reduce the amount of time of navigation they would have to do. So Valerie did a really great job of building out the site. Um, I'll just share a couple of spots. Um, one is in the area of food and basic needs. Um, as you see, there's that basic needs area. If you click on food, um, people are gonna get to some, the young people are gonna be able to get to something with one click, which is a, a big improvement. In addition, um, in the employment and job support, which is a little bit further down, um, our youth and uh, young adult workforce program, which is the um, second option there, you know, it's one click for them to get there and to figure out how they can connect with some of our community vendors. And then lastly, I just wanted to sh um, share that at the very bottom, there's an opportunity for young people to connect with our uh, navigators and our service centers. And so we've been working with Melinda Donaway and her team to ensure that there's a fast way for youth to connect with those navigators. So at this time, um, um, Madam Chair, I'll be happy to take questions, but um, definitely would like you to have a chance to 
uh, meet the young people who participated in this project. Thank you very much. I'll be watching, watching for questions. And are the young people on screen with us? I'm I believe sorry. so. Yeah, so okay. it looks like Devin's got her hand up. Got it. Yeah. Got it. All right. Wonderful. And so will they be presenting at this point in time, or should we be moving to questions? Um, they're not going to be presenting, but I'm sure they, yeah. it looks like Devin's got her hand up, Madam Chair, so maybe she'd like to share with you. Thank you. We'll call on Devin. Hello, you all. I'd like to thank you all for allowing me to join this board meeting today. My name is Devin White. Um, I take pride in being able to work on this project and creating some more accessibility to the youth of Ramsey County. Um, in my personal community activist work and just working with youth um, throughout the community, I know that, that there is sometimes a disconnect between youth, especially of today, and governmental systems and how to access and navigate through those. Um, so we did try our hardest to try to make the website as um, accessible, um, as user friendly, and as um, like visually appealing as we could with the help of Valerie and Ling and um, Rachel. Um, so I just thank you all for letting us be here today, and I look forward to working with you all more on connecting the youth of Ramsey County to the systems that um, serve them and that in turn we can help serve our communities as well. Thank you, Devin. I just want to say there is no better endorsement than that. This has been something that has been created for young people, but also by young people, you know, with your strong leaning in to be sure that the format and the information that is there is relevant and important and useful. So I just want to say thank you so much uh, to all of you who are on the line with us for your help in making sure that this happened. I'm looking to see if commissioners have comments and to call then on others who have their hands raised. I see Thomas Nelson has his hand raised and we'd love to hear from you. I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity of also benefiting and assisting our community in other ways and any small way is a huge plus for me. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. Thank you very much, Thomas, and for what I believe may be the active living representation as you are on the line with us with helmet on and likely on wheels. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. Um, let's see, I have Commissioner Mattis Castillo. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to say thank you all so much for giving of your time and your talent and your expertise to help us be successful in Ramsey County. Every time I have the opportunity to engage with you all uh, or to hear from you, I, I just feel so inspired that our we are in good hands, our future is in good hands, uh, and we have great partners like you. And so I just want to say thank you very much uh, for providing your expertise and talent to us so that we can build out these programs and make sure we're meeting the needs of all of our folks in Ramsey County. Once again, thank you so very, very much. We look forward to a future of deeper and deeper engagement, hearing from you and working with you in Ramsey County. Thank you to our young folks. Uh, Madam Chair, Without, thank you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was going to transition to the next item, but is there something else? No, okay. please go ahead. All right, thank you, commissioners. Um, I think, um, Madam Chair, you said it really well that this is just a start of some ongoing work that we're going to be doing, and certainly in the area of communications, it's um, something we want to continue to build upon. So this is really just a, a step one. Um, kind of to that same theme, um, tomorrow afternoon, um, all of you commissioners are invited to a, another youth convening. We are hosting a, a conversation um, around why counties matters with eight young people in the community. They've been given all the information from the website about your backgrounds 
and the types of work that you do. They've been given a lot of information about the county as well as a scavenger hunt to go and look for different things on the county website. And so you can expect a, a very engaged conversation tomorrow night. I think they will be asking you questions about why you are a commissioner, why you're, what got you interested, maybe some policy and service areas that are of interest to them. So we're looking forward to a, a really great conversation tomorrow to close out the month. And then lastly, I'd like to highlight um, as a part of the month, the Child Care Policy Action Group. And this effort has been led by Commissioners McGuire and Fretham, and I'll let them talk um, just in a moment about um, all the details. But I wanted to say that staff has supported this work, um, primarily Jennifer Schuster Yeager, who's the Interim Health and Wellness um, Administrative um, uh, director and also uh, Elizabeth Tolzman, our Director of Policy and Planning, uh, Kristen Poffenberger, who's one of our Planning and Evaluation Analysts, uh, Jamie Levine, an Admin Assistant, as well as myself. Um, and we've also been supported by Melissa Finnegan. So lots of staff support doing this work. This, brought, this work has really brought, brought together key stakeholders in the county who have a significant interest in the access and, um, of childcare and to identify childcare gaps. Um, one of the areas of work that I've been supporting is really around the gap around workers. And so we've been um, doing a lot of environmental scans, talking with um, critical organizations like Think Small, and rethinking how we can better support childcare workers as an economic development tool. And so in partnership with Real Time Talent, we released a robust labor market um, report on the childcare industry and where the gaps are. And um, that report can be found on the Ramsey County Means Business webpage under COVID-19 reports. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Commissioners uh, McGuire and Fretham um, to continue the um, sharing about this policy action group. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Director Becker. Wow, you did a great job of, of sort of summarizing so much of the great work that is being done by the Child Care Policy Action Group. This is a truly countywide effort that we are engaged in and just um, we're we're going to schedule a, a big workshop months from now when we when we see it all in, in fruition but just to let you know that we've been meeting with a lot of community members and we've had great great participation from our community members which was our goal was to um, bring them together conduct surveys uh, assess child care needs throughout the county and uh, realize what we can do about them. So if we set up some subcommittees to help with that. I'm gonna just talk a little bit about some of the themes that we heard, and then just mention a few other presentations and um, Director Becker already mentioned some. Then I'm gonna ask Commissioner Fretham to talk about our, our items for future consideration, and then whatever else she wants to add as she's, we've, of course, she's been a, an a integral part of this whole uh, policy action group. And uh, so just to let you know, some of the themes that we heard was that childcare is in crisis and is too expensive for families. This is something we knew, but we are um, affirming that, that legal non-licensed providers need attention, that childcare facilities are expensive to run, they have turnover and pay challenges for um, long-term success need to be worked on. And uh, there's, there's a number of gaps in the system and that in includes children with disabilities and with IEPs. And so we, we, we just had such an engaged group that, that looked at these themes and now we, get to, we have to decide, okay, how are we gonna move forward in addressing them? So we heard, as Director Becker said, we heard a workforce data report. We heard from the Children's Cabinet, the St. Paul Children's Collaborative did, did a survey, the preschool development grant uh, with Ramsey County. This was something that we're gonna be using as we move forward. And Clues did a great parent survey that we heard from. So just an example of all the work that it was done has been done in the community that we've brought to this this um, action group. We've learned from each other, and now we're going to talk about how we move forward. So we have a few more meetings coming up where we're going to talk about moving forward, and that's I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Fratham for that. But just to give all my gratitude to all of the people that Director Becker mentioned from the county. Elizabeth, Christine, Jamie, Jennifer, everyone that's working on this and um, and how we're going to move forward and really make this part of the county's internal work. So, Commissioner Fretham. Thank you, Commissioner McGuire and uh, Director Becker for your, your intros there. Um, 
And I'll, I'll reiterate first and foremost, the staff support on this effort has been amazing. And, and it's, it's part of the reason why this work is so important is, is indicated by the number of staff we've had involved in it because we are pulling from so many different areas. And I think one of those key questions um, we were asking in forming this subcommittee is both, what is the immediate need around child care right now due to COVID. And in that conversation is what does child care need uh, to, for us to move into the recovery phase? And then the greater question for us at the county is what is our role in this? Because as Commissioner McGuire mentioned, there are a lot of long-term issues and recurring themes that we heard that the county ties into as a system. When we talk about um, cost burdens on families. This ties directly to the work that we do in financial assistance in other areas. The county administers child care assistance, which is one of the key uh, federally funded measures that helps people pay for child care and helps child care providers function. Um, but that we also provide other financial assistance support. And we have a focus right now on economic inclusion and how do we ensure that all families have what they, they need to meet their needs. Uh, but that we also need to attend to our legal non-licensed providers, particularly our providers who are providing culturally responsive care in our community. So as we both serve as the licensing agency for in-home providers for Ramsey County, we also want to ensure that every family has access to care that responds to their needs. Uh, and then as we talk about uh, facilities, our work in small businesses, and as Ling mentioned, and if you haven't looked at their report, I don't know that there is another county in the country that has such excellent data on how child care workforce is particularly being implemented in our area. So thank you to Ling for that and our role as, as a support for workforce development and for employers. These are essential areas that cross um, different service teams. So bringing everyone together into the room to say, how do we as a county address this immediate need for COVID? How do we set ourselves up for success and recovery? And how do we look at our long-term role in the childcare infrastructure? And I think for me, as, as we think about those focus areas, I think about residents first. You know, as we're looking at how do we do that outreach? How do we provide navigation to families through um, the preschool development grant, but through our, our service hubs, how can we play that role of navigator and, and braiding those different funding streams together and supports for families to lift them up and get them what they need? Um, while also recognizing we have important partners in other government jurisdictions, particularly our cities uh, and our school districts and our school districts as providers, recognizing as many of us in the early childhood field do, um, what a critical role early care and education plays in someone's not only their K through 12 outcomes, but lifelong outcomes. Uh, this is an area when we talk about moving funding upstream and how do we prevent ongoing issues that the county can be doing more in. So it's a question of how do we get the right people in the room? How do we target our approaches for what's gonna be most effective? So as we look at leveraging those additional funds through the preschool development grant, through the American Rescue Plan, how do we also think about how we structure our existing systems in a way that provide those connections naturally and do the work of shifting that complexity and burden back onto us and off of our residents? Uh, so with that, we're, we're excited, we're grateful for this work and, and the role it will play for supporting our youth, for supporting families raising kids here in Ramsey County, for supporting our businesses who need workers who are skilled and who have safe and secure childcare so they can show up for work, uh, and our whole lifelong trajectory of our residents going forward. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn back to County Manager Hadeen, but first appreciating all of the coordinated uh, information that has come before us regarding our support for children, youth, and families and our businesses, as Commissioner Pretham just pointed out. Uh, we wanna thank also the commissioners who have shared with us the work around policy uh, action group meetings uh, for childcare and um, so I'll turn back 
to Deputy County Manager Hadeen to wrap this up. Uh, and, and I should also say thank you so very much to the young people who've been on the line. I see Marcus is still there and to all of our staff who have worked uh, to share this information with us, but even more so to ensure that this work is being done in Ramsey County. Uh, it certainly does emphasize for all of us how counties matter and counties being those who work for us and with us, including our community and our youth. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and really truly appreciate young people on the, on the meeting today. I appreciate your work and in investing uh, with us in our resources uh, and community. Really appreciate that. And thank you to Director uh, Becker for being here to lead the conversation. No further uh, county connections this morning. Once again, thank you so very much. I want to turn to commissioners then for brief updates, but not before we see the clapping hands and, um, you know, see the hands raised on the screen as is for the incredible work that is going on for bringing it to our attention here. So we'll turn to commissioners for brief updates. We've heard some already and we're appreciative for that. We'll start out with Commissioner Fretham and go alphabetically through our agenda as we proceed toward the close of our meeting. Thank you. Commissioner Fretham. Oh, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Carter. And I don't wanna steal uh, other people's thunder, but we did have the groundbreaking for the, for the facility changes at, uh, at the Recycling and Energy Center on Thursday. Uh, it was thrilling to get to be a part of that. So I won't say more, I'll let other people jump in, especially since I'm the newest board member to that work. So I don't, I don't get a lot of credit. I just get to come for the party at this point. Um, so that was the highlight of the week. Um, also, we had our uh, Metro Alliance for Healthy Families governing board meeting uh, as well. And our planning group for the next child care PEG. So, uh, which we gave an update on today. So that work is continuing as, as we try to wrap up and, and move on. Um, other than that, uh, no, other, no other updates, thanks. Thank you very much. And others will share with us information about the groundbreaking. Um, I'll call next then on Commission Madis Castillo. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would agree the groundbreak, groundbreaking, uh, the virtual event was really fun. And to see us in hard hats with our little shovels was really fun. So thanks everyone for that great work and the expansion of our facilities uh, to celebrate Earth Day. Um, I, in the theme of Earth Day, I participated in the rice larpenter cleanup. We picked up lots of trash in the rice larpenter area and um, with the communities of Roseville and Maplewood and St. Paul and neighbors working together. And so it was a really, it was a cool uh, Saturday morning, but lots and lots of people turned out to do some community cleanup. Uh, there's also construction underway in, in Rice Larpender um, in partnership with the city of St. Paul. There's a redesign of the parking lot of my thrift uh, and sidewalks are being put in, uh, community uh, placemaking that occurred. We'll put in a pocket park and redesign of that um, parking lot, which is gonna add benefit to the community. So if you drive by, you'll see lots of construction happening as spring has finally sprung and we can dig uh, and put concrete in. So it, good time. Uh, I also wanted to do a, a special shout out. We talked about the census earlier and it is, it's really huge. Um, and I know we celebrated that. Uh, and one area that I think maybe got overlooked or at least I didn't hear it is our elections team. And our elections team did a tremendous amount of work in the census count. And, and now they actually have more work to do as we get the rest of those numbers in and, and think about redistricting. So I just wanna give a special shout out to our census team uh, and the work that they've done as well. Um, and so with that, I'll, I will uh, stand for others updates. There's lots of great stuff happening and work happening uh, around and uh, just wanted to say thanks again. Thank you, Commission McDonough. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Real quickly, we had our quarterly State Community Health Service Advisory Committee, otherwise known as SHAC, on last Friday. Um, it's been interesting this past year. I'm trying to 
you know, stay focused in on our normal business for public health, but then um, integrating that with the work of COVID and Commissioner Malcolm has just been great in participating in that and, and then keeping us moving forward. Um, one real brief thing I'll share about that is we had a presentation about equity um, through COVID and it was really well done. Uh, and I had an opportunity to share some of the work that we've been doing in Ramsey County. And that was really helpful. I shared the story that we had at our board meeting last week from the Oranol community and the work that we've been doing and as far as engaging, but then also um, having folks that are actually at the site and, and registering and greeting people and really making feel people that trusted person in the community and how important that is. And so with that, um, I'll end my report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner McDonough. Commissioner McGuire. Thank you, Madam Chair. It was all, I was also at the groundbreaking, which was very fun. Just to get be moving forward on that, it was great um, for the Recycling and Energy Center. But a couple of other things. I am always so proud of uh, our county and our employees when you go to a meeting that includes all levels of government and you get lots of kudos about the county work. And so I was at the, the school district, Roseville Area Schools, uh, Superintendent holds quarterly meetings with legislators, county officials, cities, schools, and um, we all talk about what's going on. And we got three shout outs from all different levels of government. Roseville thanked us for our economic inclusion plan. Representative Alice Houseman thanked us for our naturally occurring uh, affordable housing that we're doing and for our housing efforts. And we got the schools were thanking us for all of our efforts and helping them with their meal distribution. But it was one after the other, people in their updates were thanking the county. And I just want to give huge shout out to all of our county um, uh, workers who are doing such great work partnering with our community. So um, great job, everyone. And then uh, just a shout out to AMC, who had a number of great meetings this week. Uh, one was on their Bridging Divides work. Uh, they also had a great government relations update. And then, you know, um, periodically on Mondays, they have future speakers come and speak. And they had one on Monday on neuroscience. And it's just fascinating to hear these, this information. And so just a shout out to AMC for all the great information they're helping provide uh, county officials. So. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Ortega. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in the interest of time, I just want to give a shout out to the Highland community. I attended the Highland District Council and spoke at the, at the annual meeting. There was well over a hundred and some people that uh, attended the Zoom meeting, half as many weren't even allowed. It, they broke the bank because so many people attended. But on behalf of the board, I thank them for uh, uh, for the community stepping up during the winter for the family shelter, uh, for the homeless uh, at St. Kate's and the good work and the continued support that they give that place. Uh, so I just want to give a shout out to the Highland community. Thank you. Thank you for those highlights. Madam uh, Chair, Squire. I'm sorry, I just have to interject that that's what Alice, that's what Representative Houseman was really thanking us for, was the naturally occurring shelters that we were using, which was in partnership with St. Kate. So thank you for that, um, Commissioner Ortega. Uh, I misspoke when I said, well, she, she appreciates all of our work, but she was specifically in, uh, thanked us for our work with the shelters. So thank you. Thank Commissioner you. McGuire. Commissioner Reinhardt. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I will try to do this quickly. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Commissioner Matos Castillo, for talking about the elections team because of, regarding the census, um, I, because their work has really, not only did they do amazing work during this uh, census process, but uh, their work really starts now. But I know that there are people like my husband who really love <laughs> getting this census data. So he has subscribed to the information. And I know that in the elections area that this is something that they really uh, look forward to, you know, because what it means is, again, uh, proportional representation. And, you know, that is the basics of our, or the basis of our democracy is that every vote counts. And 
we need to have that in order to do it. So again, the elections team, um, I am glad that you brought them up as well because of the important work that they do. I really already gave an update on Rushline. Um, the environmental assessment is coming up, um, and I think it's going to be incredibly important that we that people understand the differences between the different lines and how uh, rush line and other uh, bus rapid transit lines are really in gold line are going to assist uh, are going to grow as a result of COVID um, and the pandemic and the things that we're learning now. So I think that that's really important, but it's an exciting time for rush line. Um, also um, the, Let's see. Oh, one other thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, bridging divides um, that was done and talking about through the Association of Minnesota Counties and how valuable I found that. Um, it's really talking about how do you get to consensus? Where can you figure out how you can reach out to people that um, have differing views in you and do it in a respectful way? And the importance of conversation. And so I really thought it was a great presentation. I, as far as the Recycling and Energy Center, we can all talk about that because um, it was great that it was on Earth Day um, and there were a lot of other Earth Day celebrations that were going on and raising awareness about a, a lot of different environmental issues. But that was an exciting time um, because we really are trying to move up that hierarchy and composting, um, convenient comp composting of food waste, um, and the uh, increased recycling and doing it through um, electronics, uh, the um, uh, photo sensing and pulling that, those materials out is going to make a huge difference. So we still want people to recycle every week and pull out as much as they can uh, prior to it going to that, uh, that uh, location, but it's going to be a, a tremendous improvement for the environment. I also, um, I guess I will end with uh, the fact that we had a library board meeting and as the liaison, um, there's uh, a lot that's going on, obviously regarding the um, alignment with the county board, vision, mission and goals, um, and how that relates to the uh, hiring process for the library director. So there's a lot that's happening there. Um, they have gone through um, and looked at uh, a number of our policies, and I think it's, you know, there's, there's challenges that come with change, but I think um, in the end, it's, it's going to be something that is uh, really beneficial to all of our constituents, because we all have the same goal, and I think that's so important to recognize. We all have the same goal. And also for po folks that are wondering, some of our libraries have reopened the final two libraries. Uh, one of which is in Maplewood, is, are reopening on Monday. So um, there was a rollout and a phase in and out of, of what we were doing at the libraries. Um, and I appreciate the thoughtfulness that went into um, how we maneuvered or, or whatever through um, the pandemic and, and how we will continue to make changes as needed. Um, we're not really through it, um, obviously, as a, as a society, but we are moving towards that um, specifically in the library system with the reopenings and that connection to community and how important that is. I had a lot. There's more, but we're <laughs> on a tight time frame. So I appreciate um, you listening to those, uh, to those updates. And thank you, Commissioner Reinhardt, for the marathon update. We appreciate it. Um, the time frame is short. We're going to close out our meeting very shortly and turn it over to Commissioner Ortega for our Regional Rail Authority meeting. Before I do that, I was unable to attend the groundbreaking this weekend. Thankful for all of you who were able to. I just want to say woohoo for our opportunity to advance our ability to move up the waste stream. Congratulations to all. Uh, and we are going to move into our Regional Rail Authority meeting immediately after our conclusion. We also have a 130 County Board virtual workshop update on our advisory councils, which will be chaired by Commissioner McGuire on a separate link, time certain at 130. 
we are now adjourned.